we are not alone. These are supposed to be some of the most verified images of giants. People who do meditation for 60 days will lengthen their telomeres. Soon we'll get results and we'll let you know right here on Beyond Belief. Things seem to be changing in the field of ufology. It's gonna be a bumpy ride. That's priceless. Isn't that amazing? Tesla wanted free energy. And look what happened to him. We have evidence to show that they're real. The real question is how and why. There were Egyptian hieroglyphs out in the outback of Australia. In Australia. What are the possibilities? Mars was inhabited, and these were built. We almost can't duplicate today. These are amazing topics. What if there was something like an Area 51 deep underwater? They were killed by some animal. Believe me. We're just getting started. I'm George Nori, and we here at Gaia are committed to revealing the truth. Timothy Good has conducted worldwide research on the UFO phenomenon, including interviewing key witnesses and discussing the subject with astronauts, Military and intelligence specialists, pilots, politicians, scientists, has lectured at universities, schools, at many organizations, and has even been invited for discussions at the Pentagon in 1998 and at the headquarters of the French Air Force in 2002. He has acted as consultant for several U.S. congressional investigations. He's born in London. In fact, he's in London now. Timothy Good gained a scholarship as a violinist to the Royal Academy of Music, where he won prizes for solo, chamber, and orchestral playing. He played for 14 years with the London Symphony Orchestra. He has also freelanced as a session player for television, dramas, commercials, feature films, and recordings with pop musicians, for example, Phil Collins, George Harrison, Elton John, Paul McCartney, and Rod Stewart, and even you too. So, my God, what a background for somebody into ufology. Um, how in the world did you first become interested in the world of ufology? It, 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 it doesn't seem from, you know, uh, the, the background of being a violinist, and yeah. it just doesn't mix somehow, yet it did. Right. Well, I've always been passionate about aircraft and space travel art, so it was a natural progression, particularly when... In 1955, that's 50 years ago, I was given the book, The Flying Saucers Are Real, written by Major Donald Kehoe, of course. Mm -hmm. And this was given to me by an American cousin who said, Timothy, you know, you like uh, airplanes and stuff. Uh, it's time you learned about flying saucers. So that is really where the interest was stimulated, and I haven't looked back since. All right. In America, around the world, uh, we have had many very, very credible sightings uh, by pilots. Exactly. How, how many, roughly? Well, according to uh, Dr. Dick Haynes, Richard Haynes, who runs the um, <clears throat> National, you know, the reporting center for, for uh, anomalous um, phenomena, NARCAP, um, he thinks there's been about 3,400, and that might have increased by now, uh, since 1920. That's a lot. It's a great deal, and I think there have probably been a great deal more because many pilots do not report their sightings. Um, civilian pilots don't report them for, for, for uh, fear. It, it, it's a bad career move, particularly if they're in a major airline. We found that out, and there are, in fact, uh, regulation orders, procedure orders that were published in America way back in the 1950s for the reporting of these things, and the press was to be avoided. But... Um, as far as the military concerned, of course, there are strict regulations, and many, many um, encounters um, are, remain classified at an above top secret level in the interest of national security. And I, I can understand that because, as General Chidlaw said many years ago, and he was um, um, head of Air Defense Command at one time, we've lost many men and planes trying to intercept these objects. And that is a fact, and I think that's quite disturbing. There have also been disturbing 
near collisions with airliners as well as military aircraft, and uh, this would be disturbing if, 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 if all the facts were known. But well, I think we Timothy, have to... it's particularly disturbing in view of the fact that the United States government uh, just simply dismisses UFOs, and I think they've said they're not a threat to national security, and so they don't chase them. Well, they do, and people say to me, you know, Tim, why... If these things are so super technologically advanced and they've got presumably very adequate means of protecting themselves, why do we continue to, to send j jets up chasing them? My answer to that is that we require as much data from these craft as possible. We need gun camera film. We need radar signatures. We need communication signatures. We need, we need all sorts of info, all sorts of things across the spectrum to, to check and double-check against previous uh, experiences just how near we can get to these things, what the effects are, and we can learn a great deal more about their technology. Well, Timothy, through. you mentioned uh, gun cameras. It seems to me that um, through all the years we should have gun camera footage. We do. Uh, and we do have. Yeah. It, <laughs> how much of... We have a lot of it. Oh, we, it's just oh. it, most of it's being withheld. I spoke to a, um, a senior official in the Ministry of Defense. Um, this is before Nick Pope, by the way, one of Nick Pope's predecessors. Nick, Nick headed the UFO desk at the, the Ministry of Defense from 1991 to 1994. But back, uh, you know, 20 years prior to that, Ralph Noyes headed the same uh, department, and he told me that part of his briefing was to be shown uh, military gun camera clips of of UFOs, and he, he saw them. He said they weren't absolutely sensational by any means, but uh, these are things that, you know, have either been lost conveniently or destroyed or just just completely withheld in the interests of, of security. Well, Timothy, speaking of security, um, I'm in America where we still have the First Amendment. You're in Britain, though, where there, there there's different kinds of laws with regard to disclosure of secret things. I yes. isn't, isn't that right? Yes. Generally speaking, um, records are withheld, um, certain military records and others are withheld uh, typically for 30 years, but often to 50 years, sometimes 100 years, and sometimes some things never get released at all. Mm -hmm. uh, a classic example is that um, in the last few years, we've had some top-secret documents relating to Britain's, the British government's Flying Saucer Working Party, as, as it was called, which was established in 1950 under Prime Minister Clement Attlee. And those were only released in, in 2002, because they date back to 19, the, uh, you know, the early 1950s. In fact, they were, they were, they were released, I think, um, 2001. And um, there's still things being, being withheld. And we do now have a Freedom of Information Act. Now, you've had one for some, what, 35 years? Long time, yes. I guess. Well, this was, this was passed uh, by Act of Parliament, and it's now in place as of January the 1st, 2005. And the Ministry of Defense, anticipating that the cranky ufologists would be bombarding them with requests for <laughs> all the UFO data. They have big spent, bonfire or what? Spent months, if not years, actually weeding out tons of stuff yeah. and dishing it out so that this would sort of preempt um, all the inquiries from, from us guys. Did it? And a lot of stuff has been released. Um, Nick Pope tells me that most of it's innocuous, but... It has actually generated a tremendous amount of interest in the press, uh, more than any other aspect of the Freedom of Information Act. And um, just um, in last month, uh, there were huge articles, you know, in the Times, the Telegraph, the Financial Times, the Independent. Those are, are you know, main newspapers, and some of the some of the uh, smaller papers. Uh, local papers, but um, tremendous interest, and there was a huge article by Nick on the release of these things, and um, it, interestingly, those who are determined still to debunk everything, such as the, 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 the Times, they had a, an editorial. First of all, there was an article in the Times which ignored all the really good reports by, you know, RAF people, 
um, the good reports, impressive reports by pilots and um, other military officers, which really are quite startling cases. It, it ignored those and concentrated on the lights in the sky and the balloons and the kites and said how Britain's X-Files said that UFOs were just a waste of time. That was the headline. And the editorial actually said, pie in the sky, flying saucers are close encounters with the human imagination. <laughs> well, I really, you know, that really got me going, and I fired off an email to the Times edit editorial, but it was never published, of course. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's a lot of a lot of interest, and in, 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 and in, as I say, in the UFO aspect of the Freedom of Information Act, more than more than anything else. Do you think that the United States government and your government are hand in hand on the whole UFO thing? Up to up to a point. Art. Uh, what I think happened is that since the late 1940s, the CIA came across to Britain and chatted with uh, intelligence counterparts over here, um, Air Force people as well, and they, they, I think, suggested that we play down the really good sightings. I'm yeah. sure of this because the Flying Saucer Working Party seems to have had a remit to debunk especially the best sightings, like in 1950. Um, in August 1950, there was a sighting, a low-level sighting at the Farnborough Air Base where a lot of test pilots were based. And this thing came over at low level, an actual craft accompanied by hissing and crackling sounds. It was seen by one of their top pilots. Really? And... Uh, other personnel, and the thing was repeated at a further distance in the following, about three weeks later, seen by many test pilots. And the, those that were interviewed were told not to discuss it with anyone, not even among themselves, hmm. and the whole thing was debunked, and you can see that in, in, in the reports where they say, you know, the poor chap, obviously, uh, he was just, they were just seeing conventional aircraft. I mean, you know, and they were absolutely outraged when these reports came out a few years ago. Well, that certainly sounds like the good old USA to me. Uh, Definitely, in my opinion. Why do you think, Timothy, that our mutual good friends, the French, appear to be uh, so much more open, uh, and they really do, about ufology. It, I, I, why? Well, it's not that they don't have difficulties there. Believe me, they're, they're, um, I've spoken to, to officials, military and otherwise, there, and they're, they are very concerned about ridicule. Because, you know, even in, even in the French um, uh, Ministry of Defense, there's, the, the, there's sort of mixed views about the subject, and, and there's a need to know and all that sort of thing. So most people don't actually know what's going on, and they tend to ridicule those who take a serious interest in it. But um, they are more open. It's, it's true. I mean, they, they have this uh, group, SEPRA, is, is the acronym, and um, they still investigate cases. And, and but the real work is still done behind the scenes, as in as in other countries. Um, so it's not not as if it's sort of total disclosure um, in France. Um, if you were to look around at the various countries of the world, including Brazil, Japan, I mean, just all around the world, uh, South Africa, what country do you think is the most open about UFO incidents? Well, in recent years, I would say uh, Russia. Russia? Yeah, there's a great deal of stuff has, has come out there from, you know, high-ranking generals have come forward. They've, they've appeared in several documentaries, including in, in um, the excellent um, Out of the Blue, and um, documentaries, other documentaries that I've been involved with. And uh, it's quite amazing some of these people have come forward. And uh, Gorbachev, as you know, has come out with several statements acknowledging that he discussed the extraterrestrial threat with President Reagan at the Geneva summit in 1985. Uh, as a theoretical question or, or something beyond theoretical? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> because, he, you know, he, he didn't exactly pass it off. He said, uh, you know, the United States president and I um, discussed the question of an extraterrestrial threat and agreed that um, in the event of an invasion, the... Soviet Union and the United States would join forces to repel such an invasion. And he, and he went on to add, you know, I don't dispute the hypothesis, but I think it's too early yet to, to worry about uh, such a, a possibility. But you believe we had an agreement with the then Soviets to um, join forces in the case of an invasion? I think it's likely. Wow. 
That's pretty interesting. I, I know that uh, President Reagan, of course, made several statements alluding, yes, alluding to the possibility that there could be others. There could even be a mutual threat. I recall his saying that and the shock it brought on when he did. Yes. Well, of course, his interest goes back to 1974, if not earlier, when he was governor of California, because he, uh, there was a UFO sighting while he was flying in the governor's plane, and he ordered the pilot to chase it. Of course, they, they, you know, they couldn't get anywhere near it, but uh, it created a lot of excitement. And there was actually a Wall Street journalist on board the plane, and Reagan was all excited because I think he'd had a previous sighting, and he, he talked about um, his, his great interest in the subject and so forth. And I think in that uh, very important speech before the United Nations General Assembly in 1987, I think it was September 1987, he says, you know, um, I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat, and yet I ask, is not an alien force among us? And then he went on quickly to add, you know, what could be more alien um, to, you know, than war and the threat of nuclear war and so on. But I think he was trying to tell us something. I'm absolutely convinced of it. Do you believe that a U.S. president or even a British prime minister can take office and on their first day um, tell their aide, look, um, here I am. I want everything on my desk that we know about UFOs, and I want it there in the morning. Can well, they, they do can... <laughs> They can try. President Clinton tried. He didn't get anywhere fast, that's for sure. So, I think... do, you, do you really know that? I mean, maybe he did find out everything, and maybe that everything included, um, uh, you know, not informing the American people for the following reasons. That may be the case, Art. I, I honestly don't know. I suspect he was not told everything. Well, last Sunday, we repeated a program I did with John Lear, who took me through what's called Lear Test. And mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he went through this long litany of, listen, here, Art, here are the things. Uh, could you tell the public the following? And he named off about 25 things that obviously you could never, ever tell the American public right. and have a shred of credibility left. That's absolutely true. I, 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 I wholeheartedly agree. I don't know all the reasons for the cover-up, Art, but I, I suspect that some of the reasons would be disturbing to the... Absolutely couldn't be re released in mass. It just couldn't. It would upset the, the, you know, the whole world would go on tilt. Um, and so I've wondered a little bit over the years, and I've been doing this for a lot of years now, folks, whether I could actually be part of that process, an unwitting dupe, as it were, uh, trickling out information that the government wants trickled out. Of course, that would make it, many other people, including uh, the ABC television network, part of that process. Timothy, have you ever wondered if you were part of that process? Being, oh, yes, you know, indeed. Being used, yeah. In, in, in fact, um, I have the last chapter of my last book, and I'm going to send you my last book, Unearthly Disclosure, Art. I don't know if you have it, but I'd, I'd like I... To... I do not, and I would love it, and moreover, right. if you could sign it, I would love... Oh, absolutely. All right. In the last chapter, which is entitled Resident Aliens, I disclose uh, information which has come to me via a high-ranking source, who worked at the Pentagon in the U.S. Air Force Air Staff and Joint Staff. Uh -huh. And um, this information was given to a friend of mine, um, an ex-Army intelligence guy who's um, um, a journalist in the aerospace world. Between 1986 and 1989, he was given a great deal of information about what was actually going on, and I'm quite sure this was part of an official leak how much uh, of that how much yes how much of that can you relate here oh there's, there's tons of it i mean what do you want to know about the bases i mean i've been told for example aliens have been coming to earth for a very long time they've established permanent bases here in australia the caribbean pacific ocean soviet union and in the united states and specific locations are given in some cases now that's just for starters but um obviously there there is an amount of disinformation and the question is how yes. does one sort the wheat from the from the chaff but, how do um, you there's a great deal of in, information we've apparently uh, some military and scientific elements in the intelligence community have established communication with ets there has been a transfer of their technology we are working on it 
Um, well, let's be clear on this, Timothy. I asked you the question about the president for a reason. You know, whether he could demand everything that we know about UFOs and get it. Of course, we can't know the answer to that, but I guess the bigger question is, Timothy, uh, is it your opinion that there's a group outside of elected government, government's knowledge, that... Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Sort of a majestic 12 or, or its equivalent. Or, or its equivalent. But, of course, what I was told that, uh, for example, a hundred, at least a hundred people in, the, in OSI, which is the Air Force Intelligence Office of Special Investigations, uh, there are at least a hundred people. I'm going back to, again to 1986, 1989, because that's when this information was uh, given there were at least 100 people in OSI who had knowledge in varying degrees about the extraterrestrial presence and were actually dealing with it. When I was in the Pentagon in 1998, um, at the invitation of General Kenneth Israel, who was then director of the Defense Airborne Reconnaissance Office, as it was then called, they, they at that time handled the unmanned spy planes, the UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. Right. Um, he indicated to me that, in his opinion, this was, this was more a policing task as opposed to national security, and he therefore suggested to me or hinted that OSI was much more likely to be in charge of, of the investigations. Oh, a policing task. That's, that was his opinion. As in? Make of that what you will. As in but, cleaning up? Uh, as in, you know, sanitizing some incident? Well, uh, OSI um, has all sorts of uh, tasks, you know, other, other than some of the more obvious ones. I yes. mean, they're into counterintelligence, they're into investigations, they're into, into um, problems with uh, people violating their national security oaths and things like that. So um, I think it's interesting from that point of view, but... But um, I, I, I was given a, a great deal of information, really, and you'll learn that in that, in that last chapter. And um, there are concerns about um, what the aliens are doing. It's not a question, I'm told, of one species coming here. There are several. And more important, there appears to be a conflict of interest between, between some of these uh, beings. All regarding right. regarding our planet. All right. Um, can you describe uh, the various m motivations of these groups? Uh, if you if you understand that there are conflicts, then yeah. that would imply we understand something of the motivations. Well, I can only speak uh, very broadly here, Art. Um, there, there's, there's definitely several races. I mean, goodness knows. I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put a number on it. You know, as, as to who's been coming here and for what purpose over the years, because it's been going on for thousands of years. But I, from what I, I gather, some of them definitely have a vested interest in this planet and its resources. And uh, there is concern about the abduction process, which uh, it is believed by them that it is definitely related to some sort of hybridization program. Um, now, looking at that... Sorry, are, are, I'm sorry, are, are the resources of this planet um, uh, oil and metals and that sort of thing, or are they, <laughs> or are they more likely the, uh, the, the human occupants of Earth? I, I think more likely the human occupants. So they appear to need um, animal materials as well, some of them. Um, I do think there could, could be an interest in some of our, our materials and minerals here. Some of them have suggested that. Some people who, who've established communication with humans have established that they, that they need stuff here. Mm. And um, there appear to be a number of very large undersea bases which are causing disturbances. Now, um, <laughs> as it was put to me, you know, there's a disturb they're concerned that the fact that some of the aliens are, quote, messing around with tectonic plates in the Pacific Ocean. Now, that opens uh, all sorts of cans of worms, as I think recent events yes. um, might suggest. I'm not su suggesting for one moment that the tsunami had anything to do with aliens, but I'm just saying that apparently, according to this source, some aliens are messing around with tectonic plates, and they have some large undersea bases. Now, why are they doing that? 
I don't know. Yes, Timothy, but a natural inference from that statement would be that there could be a connection between the tsunami and messing around with the Pacific's tectonic plates. There could be. There could be. Other, or, or they might even be messing around with the tectonic plates for their own purposes, to protect their bases or to protect the Earth. You know, that's, that's the good news. I mean, there's always good news and bad news. It's like... Uh, you know, whatever threat is posed by aliens, we have to look at, at, at the positive uh, side of things. The fact that they've shown their ability to paralyze our nuclear missile bases well, at, the drop of a, at the drop of a hat. They have shown that too, haven't they? Yes. Uh, would you please explain to the audience a couple of incident, incidences where that occurred? This is pretty heavy stuff, folks. It's undeniable. I've seen specials on television about what you're about to hear about, and um, it seems undeniable. Timothy, how good is the evidence that this really happened, and what happened, and when? Well, there have been numerous witnesses who've come forward. Um, Robert Salas, for one. I, I, am, I haven't got the book to hand. I've just received a new book uh, by Robert Salas and, and another author about those extraordinary events, which is, which is very impressive. You know, I, I, I really want to, to plug that book because I'm most impressed by, by what I've read of All it. Right, so but the far. bottom line is, uh, if I recall correctly, the U.S. Uh, had a couple of missile uh, launch... They had intrusions. There have been numerous intrusions um, at nuclear missile sites in, in North Dakota, all, all, all over. I Actually, mean, they were disabled, I believe. They were disabled, yes, and it's happened in the Soviet Union, too, in the former Soviet Union. And I, I, I'm recalling this TV special in which some uh, ICBMs in Russia actually went into a launch sequence. Is that true? I vaguely recall I vaguely recall that art, but I can't, uh, I can't confirm that. Okay. Um, did the U.S. military capture an alien spacecraft before Roswell? Well, you know, um, last year, I, and, and continuing now, I'm, I've been investigating an extraordinary case reported. It goes back to August of 1945, when in San Antonio, not Texas, San Antonio, New Mexico, which is not that far from the White Sands uh, missile range. Right. Um, two boys um, encountered an apparent crashed craft, and uh, on their on one of the boys' father's ranches, Jose Padilla was the, was one of the boys, and it was his father's ranch. And the other witness was uh, Remigio Baca, Remy Baca. And I went out to meet them in June. At least I met Remy. I have not met uh, Jose yet, but we've been in, in communication. Um, it's an extraordinary story. Um, they were quite alarmed by the incident. They claimed to have seen a, a, a large area where there was, there was can in, in this canyon where this craft had come down and a gouge in the earth, uh, the size as long as a football field. It was vaguely circular um, with a sort of type of fin on top, but nothing like an aircraft fin. They've made a model of it. I've seen it. And um, they headed back, worried about casualties and so forth, because they, they actually, there was, they'd seen, when they got as close as they dared, some sort of strange-looking creatures moving around inside it, like children. Huh. And uh, they had no hair on. They couldn't see much more detail than that. And they went back and told um, Padilla Sr., who told the police, and they all drove uh, toward the, the crash site, two days later, but the wreckage was nowhere to be seen. But suddenly um, it reappeared. It, it, it had been, apparently someone had made an attempt to cover it up with dirt and debris. And then uh, later on, the craft, I'm cutting a long story short here, the craft was apparently recovered. And the boys at, at several stages got a chance to witness these things from a, from a hidden area. And this thing was, was loaded onto a tall boy. And um, as I say, they were watching from this secluded position and uh, soldiers were throwing bits down a crevice so they did, wouldn't have to carry them all the way down. Huh. It rings true, in a way. Um, a lot of information forthcoming. One of the boy, the elder boy, Jose Padilla, Padilla at one stage, um, when the craft was unguarded, um, clambered inside um, a gouge in the, o in the opening, and on a sort of um, area there, he managed to extract... A device. Now, I have seen that device and handled it and photographed it. Really? Um, the, the, 
the unfortunate thing is, and it's, uh, as I refer to as the fly in the ointment, is that it does look very, very conventional. It looks like some kind of bracket with space provisions for fasteners or screws or whatever. It's about 11 inches long. Um, it has been analyzed, and it, is, it does appear to be conventional aluminium, aluminum. So that, 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 that's, that's a problem. But on the other hand... Um, you know, we have we have the testimony of of these two witnesses, and they are absolutely adamant that this thing this thing did event. So w- there is this this contradiction which which I'm left with, and um, it is a stumbling block for me. I have to say. What about Roswell itself, Timothy? Uh, Roswell happened. <laughs> it 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 happened. I mean, you, Roswell just, happened. Just, just yes. straight out, it really. I happened. mean, all the testimony sworn affidavits from all those high-ranking people. You know, we, we have DuBose, who's often often uh, overlooked, um, General DuBose, who said that the, the, the cover-up was ordered by General Clements McMullen at the time, and there were very, very good reasons. They said, look, you know, we'd just been through a world war with uh, atomic bombs on Japan, firebombing of great cities, destruction on an unprecedented worldwide scale. Then came this flying saucer business, and it was simply too much for the public to have to deal with. And, was uh, Roswell uh, the beginning? Or, and sometime between Roswell and now, mm. when did our governments, respectively, uh, recognize, meet, even make deals with some of these creatures? And did that, in fact, happen? I'm sure you believe uh, it. I think it did happen. Yeah, I don't know about a deal... Um, but I think we we certainly, there was an exchange of information. There was a survivor, by all accounts. I'm not the only person to... um, Dr. Dr. Edgar Mitchell, sixth man to walk on the moon, has has, uh, also established very good contacts in the military and intelligence communities, and uh, he's also been told that there was um, a survivor who lasted a certain number of years, and I, I believe that. Um, I think I think official interest began bef- well before Roswell. It's certainly during World War II, because all these pilots were reporting these things. Do you not, do just, you, not just Foo Fighters? So do you think there's been official contact? Uh, when I, when I say that, I mean, I guess more than just with a crash victim, for example. Uh, has there been some sort of communication between species? I think so. Um, I'm bearing in mind the story about. President Eisenhower in 1954 um, at what was then Muroc, later Edwards Air Force Base. Um, I, I think there could be some truth to that story. And I know from people I've talked to, people say, you know, why don't they contact our government leaders, our military leaders? Well, I think, I think they have done. But those, those are the people that are least likely to come out with the truth. Well, when you look at... Uh, Excuse me. That's quite all right. Uh, when you look at the Earth... Uh, and, and you talk about minerals, or you talk about, uh, y- you know, what's here that's not on Mars and Venus and uh, all the other planets that we're now discovering uh, with Hubble and other telescopes. All these planets around all these suns, but the unusual thing about Earth that really stands out would be us. Sure. I mean, I think Earth is unique, not just in our solar system, but maybe for light years around. More than the iron, more than the uranium, uh, it would be uh, the intelligent life on Earth. It seems to me that would stand out like a beacon. Mm-hmm. And sure. that, that would account for their interest. That would be my guess anyway. And uh, the interest was definitely accelerated in World War II because of our nuclear developments, that's for sure. Well... I wonder what the current state of understanding uh, between ourselves and uh, whoever else it might be is. Do you have clues about that? No, I wish I did. I'm trying. Do you have guesses about it? It would just be pure speculation, Art. I, I prefer to deal with, with uh, you know, what, what few facts we, we can be sure of. Okay. Well, I know that... You know, you, there is a lot of conversations you have with people that probably information comes to you that you wouldn't put on the air. Yes. And and from that, I thought you might have some educated guesses. Yes, but before I exploded with my coughing fit, I was about to tell you of, of uh, Air Marshal Sir Peter Horsley, who was uh, an equerry, like a kind of military attaché to the Queen and Prince Philip for seven years. 
back in 1954. And he was also Deputy Chief of Strike Command and a decorated war hero, flown 90 different types of aircraft. And he claims that in 1954, he had a two-hour meeting with an extraterrestrial being arranged via a British Army general. And this took place in the middle of London in the presence of a witness. And he wrote up that story in his autobiography, Sounds from Another Room, and he gave me additional, some additional information, which I published in, in my book, Alien Base. Two-hour meeting. If there was a two-hour meeting, uh, I would like to know the details of that meeting. I would like to know as much as I could what was said and what was answered and uh, whatever you can tell me. Well, <clears throat> the first thing that uh, Sir Peter noticed during this meeting was that this guy, whoever he was, was able to read his mind. And later on, <clears throat> Sir Peter told me, he didn't write about this in his book, but he told me that what disturbed him more than anything else was the fact that this guy knew all Britain's top secret nuclear secrets. Huh. And, uh, well, he began by explaining that a uh, man was now striving to sort of break his earthly bonds and travel to the moon and planets beyond. We were developing, but there was a dark age on Earth. Um, <clears throat> we were prepared to sacrifice almost anything, the natural environment, animals and humans. And there was a dreadful specter of, of um, blowing up our world. So they were concerned, it seems, about that. He went on to the origins of life in the universe, stated that most of the UFOs uh, we see are robot-controlled, uh -huh. Some are manned in order to oversee the whole program and to ensure that the probes do not land or crash by accident. And um, <clears throat> they spoke that there have been, um, since time immemorial, observers of our planet, vessels out of the sky bringing strange visitors, and that contact has been established on a very selective basis um, where they judge that such contact could not harm either party. Hmm. And apparently the, they say they've studied Earth for a very long time. They have extraordinary technological abilities, very highly developed mental powers, including extrasensory, thought reading, hypnosis. And this I find particularly interesting, the ability to use different dimensions. Hmm. I, I, as a matter of fact, I, I, I was going to ask you uh, somewhere down the line that, um, you know, beings coming from light years and light years away seems incredible. Maybe it can be done, but it seems incredible. But if, if we just, you know, if we had someone come from another dimension, they would appear to us to be as alien as if they had come from another planet. And, of course, you know... You just hop, skip, and a jump from another dimension if you know how to do it. So, Well, the implication in this case is that these beings are related, some of them at any rate, are related to us genetically. <sighs> what I've heard from other sources is that uh, some of these highly advanced beings are indeed um, responsible for upgrading humanity, upgrading the, the development of human beings going way back tens of thousands of years. Um, as to the dimensional aspect, I don't doubt that there are beings who exist solely in other dimensions, but the implication here is, is that this guy was, was quite physical, quite solid, but that their races are so advanced that they can manipulate dimensions. And I think this happens with their spacecraft. There's a number of in, intriguing accounts by people claiming contact to say that it is a question not just of linear travel, I'm sure you've heard all this before, all you listeners, and, and you, of course, are, that they manipulate space-time, as Einstein called it, mm -hmm. by folding it rather than traveling, traveling in a linear mode. Mm -hmm. So that to manipulate space-time is to manipulate a dimension. And I think this would account for their extraordinarily rapid disappearances sometime. Um, sometimes maybe they're just going so fast in the blink of an eye, but I think at other times they're just translating into another dimension to, to, to get where they want to in, a, you know, in maybe split seconds. Let's jump back to something you said. You said <clears throat> uh, that we are some we have some relationship to them genetically. Boy, that sure is one sentence that covers a lot of territory, Timothy. Yes, um, well, of course, uh, this has been mentioned by, by a number of researchers going, going way back. And Yes, uh, well, are they 
our creators? Well, what I understand is that they genetically upgraded the existing beings on this planet, the basic, basic um, humans that, that when they first appeared, the, huh. the basic creatures. So there was already life existent on Earth when they arrived, and they did, they did the upgrade. Yes. Kind of yes, I mean we were we were you know just vaguely out of the, out of the the ape stage, and uh, so it is said. So it is said by a lot of contactees. I have a lot of reports of this in in Alien Base, my book, which specialises in contact stories, and there's a <clears throat> marvelous story by by Albert Coe, who encountered uh, an alien being and his spacecraft in Canada in 1920. And he had meetings throughout his life with this person and um, with, with one or more of these people. And I find that story very compelling. But that, they, does, that does make them our creators, though. If they upgraded us, interesting yes. phrase, uh, yes. then they took us from what was not intelligent life and did the upgrade that made us who we are, making them our creators. I think to that extent you're, you're, you're right, yes. And I think that this is part of a, a sort of colonization process, if you like. I think we were colonized. Huh. Um, and, and these kinds of stories, this two-hour conversation and, uh, and others, have led you to this position? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the most compelling contacts for me was a lady I knew for many, many, for several decades, in fact, uh, she's uh, passed on now, unfortunately, but uh, she had contact back in 1963 with several um, human-type extraterrestrials who were engaged in a very delicate operation which involved the use of uh, some of our, our top scientists, um, some of whom actually traveled to their bases, and they had bases, some of these people, for example, in, in, in South America. We've heard of a lot of uh, recent yeah. incidents in South America, of course. Yeah. Um, you've looked into those? Yes, I have. I think, I think there, there are probably a number of, of alien bases in, in South America and offshore. There's the extraordinary case of the guy uh, Ludwig Palman, a German businessman um, who in the, the late 60s uh, encountered um, a group of these beings and actually visited their base, which was in the jungle. Um, in the Amazon area. Extraordinary story. Well, yeah. you, you would think that um, the United States and Russia, with all these spy satellites, um, yeah. would be clearly on to an alien base? Yes. It, well, it depends what, what uh, the, counter, the counterintelligence is of the aliens in terms of disguising uh, their technologies and their, and their bases. So... I'm quite sure they're capable of, of uh, dealing dealing with that. But yes, I'm quite sure. Um, I, in fact, I'm 100% sure that some governments do actually actively use their spy satellites for trying to detect undersea and um, other activities on this planet. Yes, interestingly, the big project um, called HARP, in the HARP project in Alaska, um, one of the stated goals of HARP is underground tunnels and bunkers. They're looking for them with this wild project up in Alaska. Heard about that? I've heard about it, but I'm not, I haven't gone into that in, in sufficient degree to be able to comment. Might be worth looking on. into on, on your part, because uh, uh, underground tunnels and bunkers, that's yes. very much part of what their original charge is. Yes, Richard Sorder, I believe, has done a great deal of work on, on that. If I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm correct. Um, so if we have a relation, uh, a genetic relationship to them... To some of them. Um, to some of them. <clears throat> uh, then, um, you know, this, this does beg questions about um, all these religions that man has on Earth uh, and these concepts of a uh, right. creator um, yes. leading you down that path. Uh, Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's unde undeniable. I mean, you've only got to look at, at the Bible. I mean, there are reports, uh, apparently, in the Hindu Vedas and the Brahmin records, but the Bible is, is absolutely chock full of extraordinary uh, incidences of strange beings uh, who mated with um, yes, uh, people, yes. uh, who produced people who lived for, for many hundreds of years, apparently, if you believe it. I wasn't there. I don't know. That's all true. 
Um, and then, you know, the Ezekiel, um, Elijah and the flying chariot, all, all these things, um, um, descriptions of, of strange beings. And then the New Testament, I mean, Jesus, the star of Bethlehem, whatever that was, it wasn't a star, it was very specific, it pointed out a particular building. You have Jesus' phenomenal abilities, tele, tele, telepathy, telepathy, levitation, healing, um, and the, the resurrection, which uh, even the Catholic Church, I believe, acknowledges to be uh, a bodily, a physical resurrection, accompanied by shining beings, and then the reappearance to Paul, on the road to Damascus. You remember that story, the dazzling light which yes, blinded the soldiers? They couldn't hear anything, but, but um, Jesus spoke out of this blinding light in the sky and so on and so forth. And I think the angel Gabriel might well have been maybe something to do with arti artificial insemination would, might explain the, the so-called immaculate conception. Well, uh, it has to be said that um, so many of the modern sightings and close contact sightings seem to involve reproduction, re a study of reproduction, uh, reproductive yes. organs. Um, yes. When you get stories from people who have been abducted, sex frequent, very frequently. I, 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 you know, I was so, really surprised, Timothy, at the amount of sexual content in abduction stories when you really yeah. get down to brass tacks yes. with abductees. Yes. It's yes. remarkable. Definitely. Any any guesses about what they're trying to do? Well, I think hybridization is the name of the game. The question is, is it for their benefit or ours? They often say, abductees say, oh, you know, they were lovely beings. They said, oh, it's all just for us, you know. But all I'm, the time. All the time, Timothy. I think it's for their benefit, more likely. I spoke to uh, an abductee in, in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a country I visited on, on seven occasions. And uh, I met a contactee there who claims to have been taken to an alien base within Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And um, he saw many different types of craft in this giant cavern within the mountains. And they said, you know, nothing to be afraid of. Um, you know, we are, this is something we want to help you out, and mm. and so forth. And um, they mentioned, I believe, the hybridization. And I asked this abductee what he thought the true purpose of this hybridization process was, and he, he was convinced it was for their own benefit to help them to adapt to this planet. Well, I've interviewed many, many abductees, and the vast majority of them, Timothy, say that these are... Uh, these are our friends. These are beneficial beings who want nothing but the very best for us. And their treatment while being abducted was absolutely superb. Not a bad word to say mm -hmm. about them, Timothy. Uh, but uh, <laughs> to put it crudely, their minds have been screwed with. So oh, I think so. I think so. So, think so. Uh, you know, there are a very few researchers in the United States. I don't know about Great Britain, but you sound like you might be one of them who aren't so absolutely sure these are warm, fuzzy creatures with our best interests in mind. Right, right. Yeah. That would be you then. Yep. Uh, so if they don't have our best interests in mind, uh, what do you think their uh, agenda okay. it, Yes. I don't know, Art. Honestly. Yeah, well, that's, of course, all the big questions um, just sort of almost can't be answered. The who, the what, the where, the when. Uh, right. Almost none of this can be answered. Now, it'll be interesting to see what sort of conclusion a large network investigation like ABC's will come up with. I can't um, wait. I've got little hints that they may be suggesting at the end of it all uh, and this is just guesstimates from the Internet, folks, that uh, there needs to be a, a more serious investigation into all of this, yes. that it, it simply has been laughed at too much, and there's some serious stuff at question here, oh. at issue. Yes. So. Well, hopefully. if that's all they do at the very least, that, that, is, that is a great step forward. Um, while I remember it, Art, may I m m mention this book now? Please. About the 1967 missile incidents, particularly yeah. oh, um, please. at Marstrom Air Force Base. It's called Faded Giant, and it's by Robert Salas, S-A-L-A-S, and James Klotz, K-L-O-T-Z, with a foreword by Raymond Fowler. Uh, it's privately published, um, and it is available from... 
Arcturus Books. Signed copies are available from Arcturus Books. And I'll give you the email there. It's rgirard, that's R-G-I-R-A-R-D-3-2-1, at aol.com. And um, it's a very good book. They've got a lot of documents and uh, case um, reports. All right, give us an idea of... of Reproduced. Yes, it's the story of... It's a story specifically about the events at Marlstrom Air Force Base in 1967 when the Minutemen uh, nuclear missiles were actually um, paralyzed. Deactivated. Deactivated, precisely so, yes. I have interviewed some of the individuals who were involved in that, and I absolutely, completely, 100% believe that it occurred. And craft were seen, it was just... It It wasn't wasn't just that, it was many, a number of strategic um, air command bases where, you know, where the Minutemen were deployed. And I suppose one could... The intense interest in in UFOs and the many sightings uh, uh, may go back into the 1920s or may even go back, I'm sure, to biblical times. However, the real flap started and has never let up since uh, what? Since Roswell's. Well, gee whiz, since the atomic bomb. The atomic bomb. The atomic bomb. Now, that must have been a real marker in time and space when we lit one off. Wouldn't yeah, you think? I would think so, definitely. Absolutely, definitely. And it, it would also explain the concentration of sightings in the New Mexico area as, as you know, all the, all the testimony from, from the military and scientific people who were summoned urgently to meetings in, in, in the 1940s, you know, about all these strange objects uh, hovering over our rocket sites and nuclear sites. Well... That, and they continue to do that, by the way. That began the age when we had the ability to destroy ourselves, to utterly destroy the capability of yes. life continuing on this planet. That's what began then. Yeah. So um, any alien race monitoring us in any way would have, at that moment, taken notice. Do you think that's what happened? Yes, definitely. I'm not saying it's the only reason. But that's the reason for the acceleration of activity since World War II. In everything that you've heard, uh, Timothy, uh, about these meetings uh, with the others, how convinced do they seem to be that we're going to blow ourselves up? Hmm. Well, I'd always like to keep positive about that. but And I like to think that they might prevent us doing so specifically particularly if they have a vested interest in, in their own security and our nuclear weapons. Because it's often been said, and it was certainly said a lot in the, in the late 40s and 50s and 60s with the contactees I've met, they were told that we, we don't really know quite what we're doing um, and that the effects of these uh, explosions uh, continue in, into the solar system. They don't just affect the Earth by any means. Oh, really? Uh, well, apparently. I don't know. That's, that's what, that's what they, they, they've said anyway. Good evening. Thank you very much, George. My pleasure. Great work, by the way, in Thank this you. new investigation, Need to Know, which we'll get into in just a sec. Tim, Nick Pope, uh, making big news over the last week or so. Former uh, member of the Ministry of Defense out there in the United Kingdom, uh, looked into UFOs. He basically says the potential for war with extraterrestrials is real. You know him, Timothy. Uh, he thinks highly of you. I want just your overall on, on Nick Pope and what he's been saying. I'm glad you raised this uh, question, George, because actually I, sp- I spent the evening with uh, Nick last night, and we were just talking about uh, the fact that he's recently resigned from the Ministry of Defense, um, not in the UFO chair, as it were, that he, he, he uh, inhabited from 1991 to 1994, but uh, his last tour of duty was, was um, as a sort of defense uh, security expert, specialist, and uh, he, he has now resigned. And he has indeed stated in, um, in a press release that the subject has to be taken seriously, and it's, it's quite possible that some of these beings are, pose a threat. And, of course, he's absolutely right. The difference between Nick Pope and myself, and he's well aware of this, is that, of course, that's not something that he could, could come out with officially. Um, but I can 
come out with it unofficially because I'm not employed by the Ministry of Defence right. nor by any other government. And um, I can come out with these outrageous statements. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to do that. <laughs> but of course, it doesn't carry the official stamp. But um, as far as I'm concerned, not only is there is a threat posed, we are in a conflict situation and have been for quite a long time. And that is one of the major problems why those few governments around our planet who are aware of what's going on cannot possibly come out with this all at once. It is probably so damaging, probably so frightening, Timothy, that if they went public with it, there'd be worldwide panic. Well, the, some of the people in Washington and elsewhere I've spoken to f feel that way. But there's also other things to consider. I mean, the effects on the stock market... Um, the, the acute embarrassment. You know, you know that politicians, n nobody likes to look silly, particularly right. politicians. They like to let us know that everything's fine. You know, we're in complete control of the planet and the universe. We are not. And this, there is a situation going on, and we are not in control. And there is, I'm, I'm quite sure that the, the aliens are running the show as far as any kind of liaison that is going on. And I am convinced 100% that alien liaison has been going on for quite a long time with a select number of military and intelligence officials and a few people in the, in the political world. Well, well, and also think, Timothy, what it would do to religion worldwide. I think it would shatter it in some cases, wouldn't it? I think so. I mean, can you imagine if it was acknowledged that some of these beings are millions of years ahead of us, um, on, on the spiritual scale, and that some of them may have been responsible for planting or at least uh, hybridizing mankind on earth, and that some of our great religious leaders like Christ were in fact uh, uh, an extraterrestrial hybrid. There's no way they could come up with all this. Um, you know, the church, churches and religions are very happy to keep uh, their angels and saints and masters and so forth um, way out there in the heavens fantasizing tales about what they might or might not have said. But if you bring that all down to earth, that really would shatter religion. Yet, when you think of it in, in, in the scope of extraterrestrials, one still has to think somewhere of a divine creator. Don't you think? Absolutely. I mean, whatever you choose to call it. Yeah. I mean, the universe, the universe is phenomenal. Um, I myself don't believe in the Big Bang theory. I think that's, I find it completely unscientific for starters. I think the universe is infinite. It never began and it never will end. It's infinite. You may be right. I think it was always here. And there, there may be many universes, Timothy, Absolutely. that have always been here. You know, as I was reading the work that you've done, these revelations of these aircraft crashes during these encounters and, and the disappearance of the military and civilian aircraft encounters. This, this to me, is startling. Yep. You know, when um, I remember years ago when I watched the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, when the scene of the movie started with them in the desert, and they were looking at these returned old aircraft or a ship in the desert. But as the movie evolved, you realized that these objects with people, they were taken. They were, they were taken out of the sea, snuffed out of the air. And, you know, you've looked at that. So let's start with your research from the time period of 1930 to 49. And why do you begin then? Because the, the early 1930s were the first uh, really events that led to official research by the military into, into the subject. Uh, down in Australia, for example, Royal, Royal Australian Air Force uh, reported odd things going on. Um, aircraft and a few aircraft and boats were disappearing during the 1930s, particularly in the area known as the Bass Strait, which is Australia's Bermuda Triangle. And right up to the late 1970s, you know, in, in 1978, when the young Fred Valentich disappeared with his Cessna aircraft uh, in that area right. after officially reporting, the whole thing's on, official, on the official transcript, after officially reporting a metallic solid object circling above him. And um, there have been many such incidents. So it, it must have been known since the 1930s that something, something pretty serious was going on. All right. You, you start <clears throat> with... Uh... Uh, some work initiated by Mussolini of Italy. Tell me yes. about that. Well, th these uh, th the story about Italy is that um, 
according to Roberto Pinotti and Alfredo Lissoni, who've written a very good, very good book on this um, aspect of the phenomenon, um, it, official secret research started in the 1930s in Italy following the sightings of unknown flying objects, which were chased in some cases by um, Italian Air Force planes. There was a reported crash of one of these objects, and there are many, many official documents which have been authenticated, uh, chemical tests and, and, and so forth. And these um, reports indicate just how seriously the subject was taken at that time. And Marconi, the great scientist, was uh, uh, one of the directors of this um, outfit, Special Research Group Number 33, and there are papers relating to that, secret papers, and highly confident. I've re reproduced a highly confidential report, um, courtesy of uh, Pinotti and Lissoni. And it's just clear that these were probably the first official um, attempts at, at solving the phenomenon and the first official government research in Italy. Also in, in Scandinavia, in Sweden, they were very concerned in the 1930s and in parts of Britain and certainly in the United States, officials were concerned by so-called mystery aircraft at that time. Now, in this particular case in Italy, there was also a report of a uh, unknown craft that apparently had uh, landed? Yes, landed or crash-landed. Um, I forget the exact area. I haven't, I haven't got details in front of yeah. me, but um, there, there is a report of it. I have reproduced the actual doc, the, the original Italian uh, document relating, highly confidential document relating to that incident. Now, e during this period, as we're getting into World War II, mm -hmm. um, are they seeing, um, are pilots seeing craft flying all over the place? Uh, you, you know, Royal Air Force. Uh, the French, are they all seeing something? Absolutely. I mean, we talk about the Foo Fighters, but in a way this is a misnomer. Sure, there were numerous sightings of luminous, often spherical-shaped objects which pursued and, and buzzed aircraft during bombing missions and sometimes caused engines uh, of bombers to cut out. But there were also sightings of sometimes quite large objects, and um, I've included, for the first time, a remarkable case uh, reported by the crew of a Lancaster over France of an object which, is, which absolutely dwarfed the uh, four-engine Lanc Lancaster bomber. Absolutely giant object. And there's also official report that was secret from the British um, Ministry of Defence, or the Air Ministry, as it was then known, about... Um, Another incident reported by the crew of a Lancaster bomber uh, regarding uh, sightings, um, one of which was, was quite a large object traveling at a very, very high rate of speed seen by the entire crew. And what's so amazing about these reports, there's no way other nations, the Germans, anyone else would have had that kind of technology. Well, I'm glad you raised that, George, because often you get documentaries saying that the Germans really were responsible for UFOs. Had that been so, they would have won the war. They did not win the war, as we all know, and it is quite possible, indeed it's known, that the Germans were experimenting with disc-shaped aircraft, but that's a far cry from saying they were responsible for the Foo Fighter sightings. Absolutely daft, because Foo Fighters were seen in, in the Pacific theater of operations, they were seen in China, they were seen um, in the United States, they were seen in Soviet Union and, of course, um, in Europe, particularly over, over Germany and France. Were, were there uh, cases during this time period, uh, Timothy, 30 to 1949, where there were military encounters, where pilots, uh, you know, attempted to shoot down craft or something happened to uh, military craft? Well, yes. Well, the first time, uh, as far as as far as I know, was the officially acknowledged occasion, um, February, well known, I won't go into this in detail, everyone knows it, I think, who's interested in the subject, but in February 1942, when 1,430 rounds of um, anti-aircraft ammunition were fired at unknown objects over the Culver City area of Los Angeles. Right. And this, there's a photograph of the event, there's an official uh, declassified secret document confirmed by George Marshall that these things really happened. There is a rumor that something, something was brought down. Whether that something that was brought down was an American plane sent up, shot down accidentally, we do not know. But something was shot down, that's for sure. 
But as far as I know, the first instance when, when these things were shot at was in 1945, still just at the tail end of the war. And this, mm-hmm. this was reported to me by a free French Air Force pilot, Sean Kisling, who was flying uh, as a de- uh, with a detachment of, of um, the United States Army Air Forces um, at an Air Force base in Michigan near Detroit. And he was... There have been numerous cases of, of what they call j- uh, balloons. You know, the, the famous Fugo balloons were rife at that time, 1945. Sure. Uh, they they, they, they were, were drifted across the Pacific with uh, balloon bombs. Many of them uh, did not go off, but a few, a few succeeded in doing so, and a few succeeded as, as getting, far, getting so far as, 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 as Michigan. So it was assumed when these things were seen over this particular Air Force base. That has, that has to be Selfridge Air Force Base. Selfridge Field, yep. yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the the base commander asked for a volunteer to send up someone to shoot these Japanese balloons down, and uh, <laughs> a free French Air Force pilot, Jean Kisling, volunteered, and he went up in his P-47, and he, he had to go very, very high. He pushed the plane for all it was worth, beyond its uh, ser- service ceiling, uh, maximum altitude, and he managed to get one of these things, a spherical-shaped object, in his gun sights, and he let rip with, with the eight machine guns on the P-47. And at that instant, the craft flipped on edge, so it became a very thin disc uh-huh. on edge, and then shot away at right angles. And then, and then, as he said to me, you know, at that time, Kim, I realized it was no balloon. <laughs> So, oh my gosh, something was happening there. And also, you report that two years before Roswell, which occurred in 1947, there was another episode in New Mexico. Yes, this was reported by, by, by two witnesses um, who, who claim that in, in the village, actually, of San Antonito, and San, near San Antonio, New Mexico, um, there was the crash landing of an object. And uh, these two boys um, witnessed, witnessed this event. And I believe that they're writing a book about it. Um, I did investigate this case at some great length. I went and made a special trip uh, to Seattle to interview uh, Remy Baca, one of the principal witnesses, who was a, a young boy at the time. Um, unfortunately, he suddenly refused um, to allow me to publish the case in, uh, at all, actually. He claimed, Why? But unfortunately, I don't know. I think because he has his own agenda. Maybe, okay. Wants to do his own book, sure, fine, but sure. uh, it let me down very badly. Uh, it let my publishers down because that was part of the thing. In any event, um, I have done a synopsis of the case, um, and that's on a public uh, matter of public record, record anyway. Sure. And um, anyway, I, 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 was, I was impressed um, by, by that case. And this was, as you say, you know, two years before Roswell. Were there occupants in this particular case? There were. They saw, they saw occupants, yes, um, small occupants. They were observing from a distance this craft. Were, uh, were they dead? No, they weren't. They, they were, were moving around, darting around in a peculiar darting fashion. And um, the boys, to cut a long story short, they, uh, they went home and they told uh, one of them told the father, and the father phoned the, the police, Police phoned the military eventually, but anyway, they took the took the the boys took the the father out there together with a police officer, and um, the the craft it, itself, uh, I believe, had had disappeared. There were no aliens sighted, but obviously this thing had been had been uh, parts of it at least had been taken away, and eventually, anyway, the again to cut a long story short, the boys actually saw the recovery operation of of this uh, vehicle being being taken away. And they managed, one of the boys managed to actually get inside the craft oh, wow. um, at, at one stage before it, before it was, was carted away. They didn't cart him away with it. <laughs> Sorry? They didn't cart him away with it. They did not cart him away with it, no. No, this was when the, when the, when the de- military detail was sort of uh, off in the local bar at the time. They, they took advantage. I mean, that, you, you might think that's quite unlikely that, that they wouldn't leave something like that. Or somebody there uh, guarding it or something, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, skepticism has been has been um, um, obviously that is you know a point, but at the same time they didn't they probably didn't know what they had, you know, in 1945. That's that's my feeling, and um, it was a very difficult time towards the end of the war there. So I don't know. I I, I find it um, mostly a credible story. 
Timothy, who's provoking whom here? I mean, is it is yeah. it are we the ones firing on this UFO, these UFOs first, or are they doing something in order to get us to do that? Before we get on to that, George, I just want to make a few quick corrections uh, about uh, the Second World War and, and crashes of UFOs, crash landings. I've got several in my book, two from 1941. There's one apparently in Cape, near Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Oh, sure. There was one um, in 1941 in the Sonoran Desert in Mexico. There was the landing of um, a craft which subsequently was able to take off in 1943 on the Baltic coast of Poland. There was one that came down at a naval air station um, in Hawaii in the spring of 1944, which I find, uh, I find intriguing. Now, regarding the New Mexico case of July 1945, I just want to make sure, make, make absolutely clear, I got one fact wrong. Okay, that's right. Um, Go ahead. When they went back, when these two boys, Faustino Padilla and Remy Barker, went back, to take the, um, uh, Padilla's father came along together with a state policeman who is named Eddie Apodaca. They went back to the crash site. The craft was actually still there, though it, it, it uh, sort of remained hidden. Uh, it had been covered with dirt and debris, presumably by the, by the military who had been in there, but the creatures had definitely gone. And the huge debris field had, had largely been cleared and raked over. But the craft actually remained where it had come to rest. And evidently the army had learned of the incident and they came to retrieve it, take it away on a tall boy. And it was at that point, the boy, this, this operation lasted um, several days. And uh, it was on one, one night when um, the boys, actually one of them, Padilla, was able to gain access to the craft okay. and actually prized the souvenir off a barquette, it is claimed. And I've, I've examined that, that, uh, that sample. What did it look like? To me, it looks like a, a, a very terrestrial bracket, very, very light aluminium. It has been tested, and um, it's about 12 inches long, and weighs 15 ounces, and contains holes, um, you know, for rather conventional-looking fittings, I would imagine, sure. which I find rather unconvincing. But it reveals, the acid tests and other analyses reveal the metal to be 200 series aluminium or similar. So I just wanted to get, huh. get, get, get the facts clear on that case. Oh, okay, and, and also one quick question before we go to the, the who is the provocateur here. Right. Uh, why so many crashes, Timothy? I mean, if they had the technological ability to get here, how would they crash? Why would they crash? I think it depends on, on the cultures involved. Uh, there's not just one um, set, of, set of alien guys coming here. Um, nothing's perfect. Um, if some of them are coming here for the first time, they're not aware that the effects that our radars might have had on their on propulsion systems. That's that's one theory that's been posited. For sure, we fired at some of them. 1942 for the first time, as far as I know. Um, now, what happened was in 1947, April, May 1947, the the um, U.S. Army was testing V-2 rockets, which had been captured together with uh, von Braun and his team of, of Nazi scientists. And they were working at White Sands. And now Linda has, has, has dealt with this, Linda Howe. Right. And um, I spent a lot of time with uh, John Andy Kissner, a former state uh, representative for Las Cruces, New Mexico. He's also in the aerospace uh, industry at, uh, for, for quite a long time. And I made special trips to Arizona to talk with him. I'm very, very convinced and very by the information that he's provided, and so is Linda. And he's prov very, very generously provided me with a wealth of information relating to that early period. And it's quite clear he's done fantastic research, and he's backed it up with newspaper articles reporting, for example, that in early 1947, one of the V-2 rockets, one of the very first ones that went up, was followed by um, an unknown object, it was filmed, apparently, and it was officially acknowledged, and I've actually reproduced, um, thanks to Andy Kistner, the newspaper article, and it said that unexplained phenomena were responsible for causing this V2 to go off course. Of course. Huh. And at that stage, this was happening on a, on a very regular scale. The U.S. Army started the, the redoubling their efforts to try and get one of these craft down if they hadn't got them already, which is another moot point. I think they probably had. I think they needed to get as much technical intelligence as was necessary. 
So they started firing at these things big time and even using uh, proximity fuses. Um, very early gu guided missiles were used to fire at these things and apparently they succeeded in knocking several of these things down. And, and uh, the one or the two that came down in New Mexico in July of 1947 were among them, apparently. They took several days to come down. People reported seeing objects fluttering, oscillating, um, sailing around the skies as if, as if they were in some kind of trouble. And then, of course, we have the famous Roswell story. But it might have happened even earlier than that. I so we started we started firing at them. And then all hell let loose when... Thousands of air crashes started uh, being reported worldwide, not just military, but civilian. And the newspaper articles I've reproduced in the book, New York Times and other articles, Truman ordered an urgent inquiry. Even in the same week, there were hundreds of planes crashing all over the world, sometimes on the same day. And in most instances, they were completely unexplained. The official explanation was that the planes were running out of fuel. You know, OK. All of them? Do, like, you know, like five minutes after takeoff. And many cases, uh, of course, that's a ludicrous explanation. The other thing is that a lot of these aircraft um, were unable to get off the ground. Um, it, it, it's, it's called unsticking in the, in, in the business. They, they could not unstick. And they just, just crashed at the end of the runway and exploded. And um, this went on for, for, for months. And uh, thousands of people lost their lives. I've, uh, and regarding... This was, I think that can only be regarded as some kind of retaliation. Now, again, massive, how, sorry? Re massive retaliation. Yes. Now, again, I mean, especially if you consider that, that you know, airliners are involved here. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can any government on Earth, especially at that time in the Cold War and everything, admit that these sort of things are going on? So that's another reason for the cover up. Now, I have uh, um, got the actual official in, um, Department of Defense figures for unexplained um, incidents and, and other incidents, major um, aircraft incidents, just from 1952 to 1956, because... Do you want to move into that time period now? Is that a good time right now? Um, I think so. While, okay. I, while I have the figures in front of me, um, from 1952 to 1956, there were... Um, something like 18,662 crashes of just United States Air Force and Navy interceptors alone, all right? Those are the types of planes that would be involved in, in pursuing UFOs. All right, so it's very interesting that of those, of those fatal crashes, um, about something like 9.5% were completely unexplained. That's a very high percentage. Sure is. And then the rest of them that they explained, it may have been bogus explanations. Yes, quite possibly. I mean, they say, for example, 56.2% were caused by pilot error, 8.1% by ground crew or other personal failure, 23.4% by failure of parts and equipment in the aircraft, 2.8% by various unsafe conditions, and 9.5% by unknown factors. So... You know, can you imagine people, military, military intelligence uh, 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 analysts coming to grips, to, uh, coming, you know, being able to sort of comprehend all that and least of all let it, letting that kind of information out? Timothy, were there ever reports or documents that anybody's obtained that would have shown that, you know, our government was saying, we believe these craft are extraterrestrial, they're coming from some other system, some planetary system in the universe, we don't know where, but but anything like that? Absolutely. I mean, I've reproduced um, a document, if I can, uh, if I can get, lay my hands on it right now, hopefully I can. Um, this goes back to 1948, while I'm, I'm looking for it here. It was now, is that, United, now is, is that is that the Swedish document? That is, yes. Okay. Well, it's actually it's actually United States Air Force Europe top secret document, which uh, which is reproduced. If I can just uh, get my hands on All it right. here, I have it here. Yes, it's it, it, it's dated fourth uh, of November, nineteen forty eight. Classified top secret. It has been um, officially declassified by the National Archives in Washington. And um, there's a very interesting quote. It, it, it's regarding liaison discussions with U.S. Uh, Air Force Europe uh, intelligence analysts with their Swedish counterparts. Um, 
And the, some of the comments in this top secret document, which, which is reproduced uh, here, I have, it says, um, fully technically qualified people have reached the conclusion that these phenomena are obviously the result of a high technical skill which cannot be credited by any presently known culture on Earth. Oh, my gosh. They are therefore assuming that these objects originate from some previously unknown or unidentified technology, possibly outside the Earth. That's incredible. Mm. I mean, when you look at that and you start putting it into perspective, you have got to make the assumption that this planet has been and is being visited. Absolutely. I'm concerned about the altercation. That, yeah. that bothers me the most. Yeah. Uh, do you believe, and we're going to go through the 50 to 59 time period in a moment, but do you believe this is still happening, the altercations? Yes. yes. What, what, what has been explained to me by, by various well-informed sources is that there is a conflict situation. It's been going on for a very long time. Um, you know, like a certain simple group? Terms, there, are, there are goodies and baddies, right. and the baddies have got their beady eyes on this planet. And the, and the goodies can't stop them. I think I think they have in in uh, to a, to a, to a certain degree. There's, a, there's uh, you know I, I suppose there are sort of universal protocols for <laughs> the degree of of um, involvement in these uh, interplanetary affairs. But my feeling is that uh, we have been helped. We do have allies. You know, we have definitely been helped. And there is a conflict situation regarding this planet. Um, going on without the knowledge of, of the majority of us. Is it possible that because we are such a warring uh, civilization that the seeding of our planet, which I believe occurred, yes. may have been done by these warring extraterrestrials that are still coming back, that are still fighting, that are still trying to annihilate us? I think it's quite possible. I will go so far as to say, and I've gone so far in my book, that we are not the first humanoid species on this planet. There have been civilizations going way back, thousands, maybe millions of years um, before Homo sapiens. I'm absolutely convinced of that. I'm 100% convinced we are a hybridized spe uh, species going back maybe 200,000 years, something like that, when this planet was colonized. And they had high there technology. Are remnants, there are remnants still here today, and this would explain the extraordinary, for example, Bermuda Triangle. I'm sure that there are remnants of these cultures that have been on this planet longer than we have. They're still there. And so you could, you could say that a lot of this stuff comes actually from this planet, highly advanced um, spacecraft and beings capable of interplanetary, interdimensional travel, whatever you like from this planet, as well as beings from outside. And this is another problem for governments, to, you know, to, to say that, you know, we're not the only fellows inhabiting this planet. I'm convinced, Timothy, that there's something genetically wrong with us <laughs> because of the warring. That That's for sure. Do. Yeah. <laughs> and and it, it's very possible that uh, our uh, cousins may have uh, been the ones, may have been the cause of all this. Right. We, we, we're in serious need of uh, more genetic engineering, George. Yeah, absolutely. Now, tell me about these so-called good extraterrestrials. Do you believe then that uh, they have been battling, warring against the the bad ones and they have basically covered our back right now, watched our back? To what extent, George, as I said earlier, I, I don't know, but that there are good beings, maybe millions of years ahead of us, spiritually, technically and everything else, with whom we are related who want to do the best for for mankind, but to what extent they can inter intervene, I do not know. What I do know, and I think this is the good news, is that I very much doubt they would allow this planet to be destroyed, even if, they, even if the humans existing on it are destroyed. Do you think that the uh, battle with these other races of extraterrestrials, they would like to either extinguish the human, the, the human race or destroy the planet? I think... Uh, no, neither. I think um, we are needed. I think the abduction program, for example, obviously uh, we are of some use. Now, the question is um, if the abductions are for hybridization purposes, as is generally accepted, there might be more subtle things going on. I don't know. We can talk about that later, maybe. But if that's the case, is it for their benefit or for ours? 
are they are they creating um, a hybrid between their their stock and ours for their benefit or for our benefit? They're fond of saying it's for our benefit. I'm very very suspicious. I think it could w- more likely be for their benefit, um, perhaps to make uh, certain beings, their beings, more more adaptable to this this planet. You said something interesting uh, at the beginning of this hour, and that was for the few governments that know what is happening. Sure. Why don't all the governments know what is happening? Because they don't have a need to know. And these episodes aren't either aren't occurring in their own countries or they just can't figure it out? No, um, that they are. But if, if they do, when they do happen, um, the, the, you know, usually Uncle Sam takes over. This, this ha- has happened in Brazil. I mean, from the 1950s, U- U.S. naval intelligence was liaising with uh, their Brazilian counterparts, and they actually revealed a great deal of information to the Brazilians about what was going on. And uh, this, was, this was exposed by Dr. Alevo Fontes, one of the world's greatest UFO researchers ever. And I've cited a lot of his work in, I think, most of my books and a, and a, a, a lot in my cu- current book. And also, you know, when we had the incident at, at Varginha in 1986, you've had uh, Roger Lear on the program yeah. many times. This is a real case. Um, I know Roger. I'm convinced that, that, that the case with the surgeon is, is absolutely true. Uh, he kindly let me use that story. The, the thing is, that the, well, who came in and took the aliens away? Uncle Sam. So there, there is a control. The Americans are in control. The Americans liaise with their Russian counterparts. There is, there is definitely liaison with, uh, with Russia and the United States and a few other countries. And again, it's on a, on a, on a need-to-know basis. Right, and they are putting the lid on all of this. <laughs> Yes, it's been agreed that there's no way this can come out all at once. And what I've been told, I mean, um, one of my, my friends in Washington, I said once, this was about five years ago, I said, now, come on, you know, you must know I've been interested since I was a boy, 1955. How much longer do we have to wait before some kind of official disclosure? And he looked at me and smiled and he said, stay healthy. So I think... What I get, there is an agenda, and it's 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 kind of slow release. But um, what what concerns me is is that events may sort of uh, <laughs> uh, expedite the situation. This is this is the problem that they have. They no one can forecast precisely what's going to happen, and maybe maybe they have to prepare us a bit more quickly. 1950 to 59, very fascinating time period for UFOs and UFO encounters. Of, yep. of this time period, which ones, which events stand out the most for you? I, I think, uh, George, I'd have to say the disappearances. And the most spectacular one, for example, was in um, late 1953 when a jet was sent up to intercept a UFO from Otis Air Force Base in Massachusetts um, on the coast there. And what happened was that the plane lost all power and it hadn't reached a very high altitude. I'm just trying to to check. It was actually an an F-94C Starfire, which uh, had been scrambled to intercept this unknown talk. This target. And at that time, that was our state-of-the-art uh, machinery. That was our yes, aircraft. It was. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, what happened, um, the pilot obviously gave instructions to bail out. And normally, the radar operator in the rear seat goes first. But he wasn't, he wasn't moving. So, and since the ground was coming up, you know, losing altitude, the, the pilot ejected. After ejecting the canopy, the pilot ejected landed safely, the parachute managed to open in time, fully expecting the radar observer to be somewhere near. No radar observer. The radar observer was never found, neither was the Starfire interceptor, despite months of searching all over, under the sea, everywhere. Never found. The only thing that was recovered was the cockpit canopy, which had been ejected. Now, that was... That was not a rare event. It was happening frequently. Events like that, disappearing aircraft, disappearing people, pilots particularly. My gosh. I mean, it just, it just makes you scratch your head, Timothy. Yeah. These... And again, how can governments come out with this? You know, I mean, just <laughs> it's not as if people have recovered from the fear of, of, of terrorists uh, 
crashing our airliners and planes, you know. Um, but to admit that, you know, there's, there's, there's a possibility of a threat from, from elsewhere relating to the aviation uh, industry is, is just, it, it, you know, it, it, couldn't, it can't be done. This time period, 50 to 59, uh, around 51, 52 period, yeah. was that incredible UFO flap over the White House. And we yeah. couldn't do anything about it. No, and I think I think to this day a lot hasn't come out about that. I mean, some of the some, they talk about sort of ephemeral objects darting about, sometimes on radar, sometimes not. But perfectly solid objects were seen sometimes at very low altitude, even at low altitude over over DC at that time, as I, as I've reported in the book. Well, let's see who would have been the U.S. Uh, it would have been. Uh... Eisenhower, right? General Eisenhower, yeah. Yeah, would have been Eisenhower. I wonder what he said about all this. Well, um, there's not a lot on record that he's actually stated about the subject, no, no, to, but, to the best of my knowledge. Yet there are reports, uh, I mean, incredible reports, that he met with extraterrestrials at yes. Edwards Air Force Base in California, right? In 1954, absolutely. I'm, I'm convinced that meeting took place, and we now have evidence that uh, more people, you know, were actually attending there. And so there's, there's sort of additional testimony from some of these people. This took place at the top secret Muroc, it was called at that time, Muroc Air Force Base, in February of 1954. It's, it's sort of take, take us to your leader syndrome, you know, and uh, Eisenhower was taken. It was an officially arranged meeting. There were at least one craft landed at the base, supposedly, and um, um, there were other officials with Eisenhower at the time. I wonder how in the heck they communicated. Well, they, they spoke in English, apparently, and they also demonstrated their telepathic abilities and their ability to make themselves and their craft invisible, which caused Eisenhower considerable embarrassment. I would guess so. <laughs> was, was, was this a demand meeting? Do you think, uh, I mean, what do you think they talked about specifically? Well, um, well, it, it is alleged. I'll just give you the name of some of the people that were allegedly there. Franklin Allen of the Hearst news, Newspapers, Cardinal James McIntyre, Bishop and Head of the Catholic Church in L.A., Edwin North of the Brookings Institution, who had been President Truman's fin financial advisor, and other people. Uh, and I guess these people are all dead now, aren't they? Um, yes, and uh, other people um, have uh, have subsequently come forward, and I've, I've named some of them in the book. But uh, allegedly... Um, uh, it was they were just one of the things that was discussed was that um, they wanted to set up a, a kind of education program for the people on Earth uh, in order to make mankind more aware of their presence here. And, and, and Eisenhower was unnerved by this and reportedly indicated to them that he kind of didn't think the world was ready and that such a revelation would create a very difficult situation for everybody. And according to a test pilot who was present at this meeting, the aliens further um, seemed to understand um, Eisenhower's position. And they indicated that they would continue to make further isolated contacts with humans, but they abandoned the idea of, of a sort of mass landing or, or, or exposure. Which is what they would have preferred to have done. Yes. And I, th I think so. Oh, but God. now no, there's an, um, a, a, another significant alien encounter in the same year reported by Air Marshal Sir Peter Horsley, who is a former pilot, uh, fl fl flew uh, many of our great, great fighter and bomber aircraft. He he'd also been deputy commander of Strike Command with his, figure, with his finger on the nuclear trigger, as they say, and he, he spent seven years serving the Queen and Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, as an equerry. That's, that's kind of like a sort of military attaché. And during that period, when he was working at Buckingham Palace, as, as he revealed in his, his um, autobiography, and as I wrote first about in my book Alien Base, he had a two-hour meeting with an extraterrestrial friend, arranged for him by a British Army friend, um, in the middle of London, which he found very disturbing indeed, particularly since this, this alien could read all his thoughts. And a great deal of information was exchanged during that, that meeting. And Sir Peter told me, um, my, my last meeting with him, that the most disturbing thing for him was that the fact that this alien knew all Britain's top secret nuclear secrets. 
So it was ever made quite right. evident that this was this was a major point of concern. Our, our developments in that area. Did they explain what these creatures look like? Well, these were very, very similar to human beings. I mean, as far as uh, this, this guy in London, um, he was he was just described as, as absolutely um, human. He could easily pass for for um, an earth creature. Which means we may have been, you know, seeded from them. Oh, absolutely, in yeah. my opinion. Sure. And this has probably, Timothy, been going on for thousands of years, these encounters. I think, I, or maybe more, who knows. You write, and this is a fascinating one, about a photo reconnaissance flight near North Dakota yes. with a, a huge B-36 bomber. Tell us about that case a little bit. This, is, yes, well, this one's incredible. Yeah, in, in this was, um, I think, in, I don't have the, the facts in front of me, but in 1956, a B-36 peacemaker bomber capable of, of uh, holding nuclear weapons was approached by a 100-foot diameter disc, which was seen by the entire crew, 17-man crew and a, and a relief crew as well. And it, I think if, if memory, I, I, I wish to heavens I had photographic memory, I could sort of fish around the pages and everything, but I think it was there for something like eight or ten minutes, during which time it was filmed or photographed with cameras, Hain cameras specially issued by Project Blue Book in the event of such occurrences. Oh and when God. the aircraft landed, um, all, the, all the cameras were, were confiscated. So these photos are somewhere. Oh, gosh, yes. We have photographs. I mean, look at, look at the instance following year, 1957, when Gordon Cooper was flight test director at uh, top secret Edwards Air Force Base, which used to be called Muroc in California, when a craft actually landed and was filmed by his, Gordon Cooper's camera crew. Um, Extraordinary story, great, great detail. Cooper himself just had a a brief look at uh, some of the frames from the movie film. All sorts of film, uh, still film and movie film was used. Very, very clear pictures of this craft. It extended landing gear, and then it took off everything on film. It was sent back by special pouch to Washington. And uh, Gordon Cooper was told, um, you know, not to, not to actually look at the whole film, but, he, but no one told him. I mean, he did see some of the frames of it, that's for sure, but he didn't see a projected version of it. I remember talking to him when I was in St. Louis, and he was describing his encounter with uh, his, uh, he was flying uh, in F-86 jet, Saber jets. Think. That's right, yeah. This was at Neubiberg Air Force Base um, in, in 1951. In, in Germany, in, right? In Germany, that's yeah. right, U.S. Air Force is Europe. Incredible story. I mean, and he was convinced what he saw... Yeah. Or UFOs. Yeah, I mean, I've got I've got the word the case in front of me now, and there was an alarm, and he said one day this 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 was a regular occurrence, you know, sending up jets to to chase the the, the sources. He said uh, one day the alarm sounded, my squadron mates and I dashed from the ready room and scrambled skyward in our F eighty sixes to intercept the bogies, names for unknown. He was one of the seven aircraft. original astronauts, and he was not Absolutely. kidding. Yep. He said, we reached our maximum ceiling of around forty five thousand feet, and they were still way above us, traveling much faster. I could see they weren't balloons or MiGs or like any aircraft. They were metallic, silver, and saucer-shaped. He says, for the next two or three days, the saucers passed over the base daily, sometimes appearing in groups of four, other times as many as 16. They could outmaneuver us and outflank us seemingly at will. So these things were, were quite commonplace. This time period, 1950 to 59, uh, I also used to remember reading books and stories uh, later on in my, because I was born in 50, but later on into the early 60s, uh, Frank Edwards. Yeah. Great reporter. Oh, sure. Did a superb job at that time. It kind of reminds me of you, Timothy, in that, uh, you know, in terms of an evolution of the progression of UFOs and extraterrestrial investigations, he was one of the first. Absolutely. Um, my work was inspired initially by Donald Kehoe, for whom I have enormous respect. Yes. Um, that's how I got interested back in 1955. Um, I still cite his work in, great, uh, in my books and that of Frank Edwards, for whom I had enormous admiration as well. Of the Donald super, Kehoe. Superb, at, superb journalist. Kehoe at the time head up the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. NICAP, NICAP, that's right. In, yes, uh, until it was until it was infiltrated by the CIA. 
it, and disbanded eventually. Yes. Right? Yeah, sure. I remember that. I, I mean, as a kid, I, I, you know, I joined as a little member, and I got my card from them, and yeah. uh, it was based in Washington D.C. That I'll always remember. Yes, absolutely. Um, it was. I don't think any group in the world has ever succeeded um, as that one had done to to get the subject across to the people, and with with such fantastic support from from military officers, retired and sometimes current. Um, yeah, Amazing. They, they had heavy hitters in that organization in Absolutely. those days. Absolutely, all sorts. So this this was a time period, I think, where UFO reports, sightings, and encounters might have been at their peak, 50 to 59. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I, I think so. Since that time, it, it's, it's sort of less... Uh, there's, there's more pockets of, of events in a shorter shorter period. This was just going on and on, you know, day after day in the 1950s. Um, there were there were there were sometimes sort of lapses in in, in activity, but uh, generally speaking, you know, there 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 seem to be much quieter periods, um, don't there these days? That's yeah. for, that's for sure. I mean, because there's no doubt that during that period. Something was happening because there were too many military pilots, too many commercial yeah. pilots reporting these very strange and unusual lights. There was too much interest by government and with individuals and even even newspapers of this era reported on, you know, sightings uh, where newspapers today, they, re- they really won't handle it. I mean, yeah. you've, you've got to land on the White House lawn before they're going to yeah. do a major story on this. Yeah, and, it, and it's quite clear um, that, that even, even people that you might think would, would have a need to know about what was going on at the time did not, including Major um, Cabell. This, he was head of Air Force Intelligence yeah. in, in 1950-51 area. And um, there was a top meet, according to... Uh, Ed Ruppelt, who was, uh, you know... The, headed up headed, Project headed, Blue Book. Project Blue Book. There was a top-secret meeting held at the Pentagon to discuss the UFO s- situation presided over by General uh, Cabell and his entire staff. And um, in his private papers, Ruppelt reveals some ex- astonishing information uh, that he, he obtained that... Uh, um, Cabell just went absolutely bananas. He said, I want an open mind. I, want, I order an open mind. Anyone that doesn't keep an open mind can get out now. Um, and he, he asked about the results of the investigations to date of several good sightings, but uh, telephone check to Air Technical Intelligence Center showed they'd been lost. No one could ever find them. And he started, he went purple in the face. He said, what do I have to do to stir up the action? Anyone can see that we do not have a satisfactory answer to the saucer question. He demanded that the project be reorganized uh, because directives weren't being followed. And he looked at his staff of colonels for a long time and said, I've been lied to and lied to and lied to and lied to. I want it to stop. I want the answer to the saucers, and I want a good answer. And it's very interesting that uh, he cited the Mantell case when this, uh, the incident in 19, January 1948, when uh, Captain Mantell lost his life pursuing a UFO. And he said that he, Cabell, said he'd never heard such a collection of contradictory and indefinite statements. And he had a great deal of doubt in his mind that the sources were all hoaxes, hallucinations, or representation of known objects. And, and I, I love this. He took, he took a swing at the Project Grudge report, which you re- may remember, which, yes. which was largely... Um, sort of reinforced by the negative conclusions of uh, Alan Hynek, saying that it was all explainable and, and so on. And boy, so did forth. he change his tune later on in life, yes. didn't he? Yeah. And he's, this is what General Cabell, head of U.S. Air Force Intelligence, he described it as the most poorly written, inconclusive piece of unscientific tripe that he'd ever seen. I have got to ask you in the moments we have before the break... Yep. about the U.S. Army soldiers that were firing at a UFO during the Korean War and they sure. were irradiated. Absolutely, yes. What, what happened here? Well, this um, I haven't got the details in front of me, but I, I shall find them presently. But uh, an unknown flying object um, appeared in, 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 in this area um, of, of Korea, uh, during an exchange, and of course the the u s army guys were convinced that um, this was you know 
something Korean. So they, they let rip. They started firing at this thing and actually managed to um, strike, strike the object. And it, it could be heard, the, the, the rounds clanging against right. this Ding. thing. Yeah. Um, I don't have the details in front of me. I wish I could, could find them, uh, George. But, 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 I, but what, what happened was, the upshot was, that the craft uh, started behaving in a very erratic manner, and a beam of light came towards the soldiers. It irradiated them. They became very ill with what I can only describe as a type of radiation sickness, and um, they, were, they were debriefed about it, and some of them soldiers were taken away to hospital. A very serious incident. This time period now from the 60s on be, became very interesting, very fascinating in the, in the UFO field. Uh, there was almost as if a change by the mindset of these extraterrestrials, yet we continued to try to fight with them, didn't we? Yes. This was the, this was the problem. Um, quite obviously, it was dangerous to go trying shooting at these things, and m most air forces were aware that there was a likelihood that the pilots would lose their lives or the plane would disappear or whatever. But the instructions still went out. Why? I think I think I can understand why that military and technical intelligence people wanted to acquire as much information as possible. So there was still an attempt to knock some of these things out of the sky. Timothy, anything in your research about, at that point, the newly elected John F. Kennedy and his knowledge of UFOs or things that he might want to reveal prior well, to his assassination? Absolutely. I mean, for the first time, uh, I was lucky to speak to um, a White House staff uh, member at the time of that administration who, who knew Kennedy rather well, and I was able to acquire considerable body of information um, which I can I can share I have published it in the book um, this is what I've learned around 1961 to 1962 I'm, I'm quoting here my right. source okay. President Kennedy expressed a wish to see the alien bodies associated with an alien crash site he had obviously been informed of their existence and wished to see for himself the evidence General McHugh was in charge of the arrangements at the time, and Air Force One was used to take Kennedy and other top brass on this visit. The purpose of the flight was closely guarded. However, the reason for Kennedy's flight became evident to senior personnel on board through unguarded comments and the whispering which went on. Remember that even the pilots were members of the White House staff, ex-military and trusted implicitly. Originally, the alien bodies were located at Patterson or Peterson Air Force Base and later moved to Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida, near Pensacola. These comments are from the horse's mouth, a person who was close to Kennedy at the time and a member of the White House staff. Since any alien evidence has been covered up for as long as rumor has existed, the United States authorities are unlikely to admit their complicity or make information available to you. There is clearly an international agreement in force between all governments to withhold information on alien and UFO phenomena. Well, that is uh, essentially the information I acquired and I subsequently learnt uh, just a little bit more as well, which, uh, again, I have, I have published in the book. But um, essentially, that, that, that's it. Do you think that had anything to do with, and I, I'm sure it wasn't just it, but anything to do with his assassination? The fact that maybe one day he wanted to go public with this? I can only give my own opinion, George. I have no information. Um, I do think so, yes. And here's for why. You may remember the famous Maury Island incident several days before Kenneth Arnold's sighting in June of 1947 when this, this craft was seen allegedly spewing bits of wreckage and everything right. appeared to be in trouble. The principal... Uh, investigator of that case was a guy called Fres Fred Chrisman, who was uh, who had been a counterintelligence agent for a number of agencies: United States Air Force Intelligence, um, CIA, as well. Just coincidentally, he was one of the three tramps picked up um, at the Dealey Plaza. Do you remember those tramps? Oh, don't, don't, don't! He was one of them. He was one of them. Fred Chrisman. Well, no, what are the odds of that happening? Exactly. That's amazing.
and he was heavily into counterintelligence involving the UFO subject. So I've just mentioned that as an aside in the book, in the reference section. And, I, I uh, also wonder, Timothy, if on that plane flight to go witness the, uh, the bodies, the creatures, if Kennedy brought Marilyn Monroe with him, because there have always been rumors that she was going to say something, and that's why yes. they possibly did her in. Yes. Well, um, I have no evidence uh, uh, regarding that, but I do find her death very suspicious, that's for sure. Back to the 60s through uh, 2006, and of course we'll get into the many things that have been going on in this time period. But uh, you mentioned a little bit about a Hollywood actor, Stuart Whitman, whom I used to remember. I don't know if he's still alive or not. Um, I don't know. Maybe you could find out. Maybe, uh, I, you, could, maybe you could get him on the program. Yeah, I, I, matter of fact, I'll find out within minutes while you and I are talking if he's alive or not. Yes. Um, but he... But he communicated with you yes this was this was during the famous power power cut um do you remember that was in, in 65 in november 9th of november 1965 yeah. uh, it was definitely caused by ufo activity in my opinion and it was the opinion of professionals uh, like like Do- uh, dr james mcdonald for example as he pointed out in a in a hearing before the house committee on science and astronautics that you know um how a UFO could trigger such an outage on a large power network is, is not clear, but this is a disturbing series of coincidences because, because that, um, there were UFOs seen at that time. Anyway, uh, Whitman was alone in his hotel room in New York City during that blackout, and he says he was awoken just before dawn by a whistling sound. I think he said it was similar to a whippoorwill. And two strange objects could be seen outside of the window, and one of them was orange and the other blue. They gave off strange luminescent light, so I couldn't see if there were portholes or what. Then I heard them speaking to me as if they were on a loudspeaker. They spoke to me in English. It may not have been audible to anyone else. I was probably tuned into the right wavelength. They said they wanted to talk to me because I appeared to have no malice or hate in my soul. They said they were fearful of Earth because Earthlings were messing around with unknown quantities and might disrupt the balance of the universe or their planet. They said the blackout was just a little demonstration of their power and that they could do a lot more with almost no effort. It served as a warning. They said they could stop our whole planet from functioning. They asked me to do what I could to fight malice, prejudice, and hate on Earth, and then they took off. I felt elated. I wasn't even shocked. I was standing by the window and awake the entire time. I don't know why they picked me as a contact, but I'll swear off a Bible that I saw them out there and that they talked with me. He's 80 years old, so he's still alive out there. Great. Maybe we'll try to find him. That would be an incredible story. Yes. I will try, and uh, we'll get him on the program. Uh, During the 60s, what events uh, for you, in terms of what you investigated, stand out the most? Oh, goodness me, George. There was so much going on um, at that time. Uh, Remember, we talked about the 1950s. There were spasmodic gaps in in the 60s. But, I mean, 1965, I was in South America uh, touring with a symphony orchestra at the time, and all the papers had headlines about it. They were all over South America at that time and other parts of the world. 67, I think, was a watershed year, no question. Things quietened down in 66, but generally speaking, 1967 was a bumper year all, all over the planet. Um, I don't know which one to single out, though, but just, just so many. Well, then I'll ask you a few questions about some. Have you, did you ever investigate, in, in this area fascinates me, underwater UFOs? Oh, absolutely, and I've got lots of those in the book. And I think for the first time in any, any sort of uh, uh, substantial degree, sightings by, by naval uh, observers, um, naval officers, Chilean Navy, naval officers, Royal Canadian Navy, United States Navy, and the Soviet Navy. And uh, they, those kind of reports kind of increased in the 1960s and 1970s. And uh, they tend, we tend to overlook them. I mean, the, uh, most of this planet is sea. Um, you know, two thirds sure. of the planet is 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 water, and um, there have been an awful lot of things. The United States Navy has a is sitting on a vast amount of information. Um, they've released barely anything, but I have spoken to naval officers uh, who've had the most incredible sightings, like uh, Jim Copp in 1971. 
who held top secret uh, crypto clearance at the time. Um, and he's confirmed that uh, in 1971, a huge UFO was observed above the deck of the aircraft carrier, the USS John F. Kennedy, uh, in 1971. And it disrupted all operations on the aircraft carrier, paralyzing communications. The, the, normally, uh, aircraft carriers carry like uh, an interceptor on board to intercept unknown craft. The, the, the Phantom Jet, the F-4, could not get off the ground, um, the engines wouldn't, wouldn't start, electrical breakdowns, malfunctions, the whole lot. This was only seen, uh, Jim Kopp, this is the guy's name, James uh, M. Kopp, um, the case has been published uh, before, but he, he was able to give me a lot more information and uh, extraordinary um, that relatively few people actually saw it at the time. It was at the end of an exhausting um, exercise um, in the Caribbean at that time. It was somewhere in the vicinity of, U of Cuba, I think, uh, where, where the event happened. But um, at any event, it was very, very disturbing. Um, Jim Kopp thinks that probably no more than about 20 people may have actually witnessed this huge spherical-shaped mass, massive object uh, above the tower, as they call the, the, the bridge area um, on an aircraft carrier. I mean, there's 5,000 guys were on board at the time, but, but only far. relatively few people actually saw it, though everyone was aware of the power failures. What do this, you was, this was happening to lots of naval ships at the time, oh, yeah, particularly I'm... those carrying nuclear weapons. Or they'd be tracked, right? Yes, sure. I mean, um, not only were, were they tracked, I mean, all, all, the, all those kind of tapes, the radar tapes, um, sonar and everything, none of that has been released. If When entries were made into the logbooks like on an aircraft carrier, I think there's uh, probably at least two, two de there's, there's uh, uh, different logbooks. What happens is they're either expunged or they're changed in the handwriting of the person making the entry, or they're just completely, completely deleted. What? And that, that is true. This is why you'll never get anything um, unless anyone, any pressure is put on the United States Navy. They, are with, they, I think, have great more knowledge on this subject than the other services, since they probably have evidence or proof going back further than the Air Force. That's, that's my opinion. What do you think is going on with these alien abductions? Hmm. What's your take? I mean, David Jacobs thinks there's something sinister going on. But, I agree with him. Bud Hopkins has his thoughts. What do you think? Well, I've spoken to both. I'm a great admirer of, of both writers. I think, um, although some of the abductions have definitely been benign, um, I do feel there is a sinister element to, to what has been going on. Um, I, I don't speak just from what I've read, but from my own personal experiences. Uh, it's not generally known, and I haven't really discussed this in my books much, and certainly I haven't discussed uh, my, my quasi-abduction experiences at all, either on the airwaves or, or, or in a book. No, but except from the fact that I have had on hundreds of occasions, I've suffered from uh, night paralysis, and it's got nothing to do with, with, with the official medical explanations because I've, I've shared that experience with, with um, a, for example, a girlfriend at the time was experience, experiencing it. it uh, I have always fought against it, I have always, as far as I know, managed to get out of it. It is definitely accompanied by a very sinister feeling, I have to say. I do not, in, in, certainly in my experience regarding abductions. Let me quickly give you um, the most recent episode, George. Okay, please. Uh, only twice in my life have I actually seen anything or experienced any quasi-abduction experience. And in March of this year... I went to sleep, I remember, at 5 to 1. <clears throat> the next thing I knew, I was out in a road somewhere looking up at a triangle in the sky with white lights along each rim. It looked as if it was stuck in the sky. It was dark gray. I couldn't see stars or anything, but I could feel the night air on my face. I don't know where it was, and suddenly I felt myself being drawn up into the craft, and I just gradually resisted the, 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 the paralysis feeling, and I, I, I shouted out for help. And I woke up, and I woke up at five past one. So whatever that was, I don't know, but it was very real. And um, I did not get a good vibe, vibe from that at all. I want you that's to... the first time I've discussed that publicly, by the way. Yes, it, yes, it is, and thank you for sharing that with us. You mentioned earlier this 1978 case of the uh, young pilot who was in his small plane. He saw a disc. Uh, he, he's... Uh, he, 
in uh, Australia. Metallic craft yeah. over, over the best straight in Australia. Yeah, Frederick Valentich. Somewhere there's a recording of him yes. calling this in, isn't there? Oh, well, the whole thing is, is has been. Uh, I haven't actually heard his tape, but um, Dick Haynes. <clears throat> of the National Aviation Center for Reporting Anomalous Phenomena has, uh, I think he's heard the tape, and he's written a book on the case, an outstanding book. There is another, I have actually heard a tape of another incident in 1980 involving two young Puerto Rican pilots who were flying between uh, the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico in a light aircraft when they were being threatened. I can only use that word. They were being threatened by an unknown flying object, which was, was causing them to change course. And this is all a matter of official record because the National Transportation Safety Board has released a document. I've reproduced a page from it. They say that this thing was not an aircraft. Um, it was very threatening. And that, that was the last that was heard from them, despite a five-day air sea rescue search. Or, and those two young pilots simply disappeared together with their aircraft. How can any government come out with this stuff? But they have, because the, the actual uh, transcripts of some of these incidents has been released. Can you help us get a copy of this tape of this individual uh, who uh, disappeared in Australia? I don't have a copy of it, George. The only person, I, I, I did just hear it, but I, w- I wasn't allowed a copy at the time. But I know that Jorge Martin in, um, in San Juan in, in Puerto Rico uh, has a copy of that. Whether he's, he's likely to make it available, I don't know. But um, I would think certainly the National Transportation Board must must have something on it, or the, the San Juan uh, International Airport officials might help you there. That would be incredible. Mm-hmm. I mean, absolutely. And what about Haynes himself? Might we be able to get it from him? You could ask Dick, yes, sure. Okay, we can track him down. But we're in this time period now. What's going on in the field of ufology, Tim? Well, Events seem to be fairly spasmodic. I mean, unless you, you, you sort of follow, follow the Internet um, rumors and um, numerous uh, alleged videos of UFOs and things, some of which are genuine, I'm absolutely sure, but most of which is really not to be discarded, I think. But um, there seems to be a lot going on in South America. But events in this country appear to be very spasmodic at the moment. But I have highlighted some very disturbing cases, talking about harassment of aircraft and a threat to aviation safety. In Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, in Dublin, um, in, in the Republic of Ireland, in, starting in January 2004, I have case of, for example, an Aer Lingus Boeing 737 on its final approach. According to uh, um, a British Midland Airbus pilot behind, five miles behind, could see a large triangular object rose up from the ground and harassed this airliner, causing the outside air temperature to go up to 164 degrees Celsius, causing the plane's wings to be damaged. Uh, he couldn't, he couldn't um, um, operate. The air brakes were damaged as well. The plane landed safely, thank God. Um, this was in the evening. Two hours later, another similar incident occurred involving an identical-looking triangular-shaped craft which harassed uh, um, another airliner on its final approach. So there you have these cases, all officially denied, but uh, very, very disturbing for, for governments. But they, they do uh, – it's, it's not common. I have to – I hasten to add, it is not common. The, these reports that these beings are being – that people are being taken by these craft. Yeah. Where are they taking them? I mean, are they taking them back to their planet? Are they dissecting, dissecting them? <laughs> what are they doing with them? I don't think they're dissecting them. Um, Let's hope not. <laughs> uh, short answer, George. I, I don't know, but I think hybrid. It's quite obvious that hybridization is is a, a very very strong part of, of of their agenda. Do they? But I would just wonder. I mentioned earlier. I might I might go further, but I have a feeling if there's something more sinister going on, they might be after more than just uh, sperm and ova. Um, you know. So. Think well, about that. That could be. That could very well be. Timothy, we've already uh, gone through another hour. This is a remarkably fast night. Timothy, is there a single most compelling story that you've uh, uncovered uh, with your investigations that just c- continues to baffle even the best of them? Ha! Huh. Well, I don't know. I-, I suppose recently the most interesting one for me, at any rate, which uh, continues to baffle me in many respects, is the case involving the so-called Amicizia group. It's uh, an Italian name for friendship, which was founded, if you like, way back in 1956. And 
I've met some of the principal protagonists who were actually involved in a series of contacts with extraterrestrials, which started then in 1956 in Italy and other countries in Europe, and <clears throat> continuing um, until relatively recently. And some of those people are, are highly qualified, very credible. Um, the beings they encountered varied from very short beings, not your typical greys by any means, but very short beings to beings um, of up to 10 feet tall, oh. which of course sounds incredible, but uh, the tallest man on earth is, is sort of around eight, nearly eight feet tall, if not more, I believe. Um, so it's not, but it, it's full of, of uh, farcical elements, um, but also a great deal of information and disinformation. And uh, this group, um, it's loosely called Amicizia because of the people that are involved with the group, including the ETs themselves who communicated with, with um, hand-picked extraterrestrials from many different walks of life. I mean, I'm talking about um, engineers, scientists, specialists in various scientific disciplines, university professors, and um, military people. <clears throat> this has been going on for a very long time. Sure and has. you don't hear so much about it now, but um, as I say, I have investigated it pretty thoroughly, and there's a great deal that still baffles me. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn, but um, it is it is quite quite extraordinary, I, I, I have to say. And, Did you... uh, for me, that's the most... Uh, most um, extraordinary event that um, I've learned recently. Didn't you want? Didn't you write a book about George Adamski some time ago? I did indeed. That was in 1983. My co-author was Louise Zinstag, a, a cousin of of Jung, the great uh, psychologist, mm -hmm. and uh, it had a foreword by uh, Lady Faulkner, who was the personal and private secretary to Prime Minister Harold Wilson. Uh, many years ago, and uh, she she contributed a forward to it, and I I still stand by a lot of what Adamski said. I think he was absolutely on the ball. Uh, later on, he became I think misled by by certain um, people, perhaps from certain extraterrestrials. Uh, we don't know. He said there was a conflict going on and that there were some dangerous species around, and this is exactly what, what uh, is mirrored in the Amicizia report. Was he taken seriously during his day, Timothy, or did they laugh? Well, at he was him? certainly, I can tell you, he was certainly taken seriously by the government. You know, he, he had a, a U.S. government ordinance passed, which gave him access to all, that this has been confirmed by three people I know, which gave him access to all military bases in, in, in the United States mainland and abroad. And I know that uh, he, 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 he visited Kennedy in 1963. Kennedy met him in a secret meeting um, in the Willard Hotel in Washington. And Adamski allegedly arranged um, a meeting between, between Kennedy and, and uh, the ETs in California at a secret Air Force base in California. He definitely was liaising. Also, I can tell you, that in the United Kingdom, this hasn't, uh, it's, it's barely known, but um, Adamski was spirited away by Lord Mountbatten, who was a former chief of defense staff in 1965, I think, and uh, of course uh, related to, to Prince Philip, who was also very interested in the subject. And Mountbatten um, and another gentleman, uh, were very, very uh, keen to, to grill Adamski about um, his experience. And they took him seriously. And Adamski never, ever mentioned mentioned that, just as he never mentioned all, all sorts of military people at Tibu's meeting. Timothy, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, hybrids, and then we'll get into some of these incredible other aspects of your work uh, need to know. So do you think some of the hybrids are here now on this planet? Well, yeah, first of all, George, um, I've not really discussed hybrids in, in need to know. If I ever get down to writing another book, um, which I hope to one day, I shall certainly go into this uh, in some detail. What I learned, as I said in the previous slot, was that um, my information does go back uh, 20 years or more. But what I have learned from uh, an ex-military source, I think, is, is extremely important. 
what I have learned about these so-called greys, if you like, um, who are one of a species that have a vested interest in this earth, is that they have or had a long-term plan to create a race of alien human hybrids, um, as I said earlier, allegedly to make us more peaceful. But their true purpose is to create a passive human race incapable of violence by eradicating the human emotions that enable us to survive, thus setting us up for conquest. And I'm told that even a U.S. president has been abducted, don't ask me which one, as well as a chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Interestingly, the, the creatures usually prefer to impregnate human females artificially with their male seed. And the wombs of alien females are tiny compared to those of human females and cannot accommodate transgenic fetuses for more than two months, allegedly. The human womb is the receptacle of choice for their cross-breeding program. Cross-species copulation is a rarity, thus artificial insemination is used. Cross-breeding and, and genetic experiments apparently have been on a colossal scale, possibly including wayward bacteria and viruses, though that is doubted by the, those in the military who, who, who are dealing or have dealt with this thing. Now, you mentioned um, panic, George, I think, earlier. Absolutely. The, the, what I've been told is that the, these, these beings, are the creatures, are well aware that panic would ensue were they to reveal themselves openly. But they can't chance that because they would be in danger. They are not invulnerable, apparently. And since the ball is in their court, those in charge of this hybridization program are playing a waiting game. Sorry, those in charge of the, the, the program, the hidden government, if you like, are playing a waiting game. Every world leader who has been exposed to this problem feels the same way. And what the, the, this military guy said, you know, it's in their hands. If they decide to go public, however, and scare the hell out of the whole wide world, there's nothing we can do about it. That's what I learned. Um, now, in, in this uh, regard, it, it's interesting that I think it was last year, uh, a local newspaper in Jordan reported on its front page that flying saucers flown by creatures 10 feet tall had landed in the desert town of Jaffia. Amid panic, the mayor put the security authorities on full alert. They searched the area and found nothing. I almost considered evacuating the town's 13,000 residents, he said. Students didn't get to school. People were scared the aliens would attack them. It was, of course, an April Fool's joke. But I think it's this year, actually. But it does go to show that panic is still a fact factor to, to be reckoned with. Well, it, it sure is. And I, I've learned also that regarding these, these creatures, the, the, the abducting ones, they, although they know more about human physiology than we do, human psychology remains a mystery to them, which I think is perhaps just as well. <laughs> and um, as I say, always let us not forget that, that by all accounts, we, we do have allies also based here on planet Earth who, who do have our best interests at heart and who have been and probably still are, I'm guessing, in conflict with, with these other creatures. You know, I had an opportunity uh, this weekend to see a little bit of uh, one of my favorite movies again, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, oh, sure, yeah. Cable Network was showing it, and... We've uh, we had Richard Dreyfus on the show a little more than a month ago, Timothy, just for a bit, and he's going to be back on in the studio when I get back to uh, L.A. And, oh, great! I mean, it's just a great, great movie, and you know, I want, yes. want to ask him what it was like for him to portray it and his belief and everything else. But yes. you know, this 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 feeling of government communication with ETs has been so widespread has been reported for years. Mm -hmm. How widespread do you think it is, that it's relationship? Not, it, it's really not, not wide, that widespread, George. It, it, it is highly restricted to, to uh, people in, in, in the military, largely, and um, scientific intelligence community. Um, there are people in, in, in civilian posts in government who, who are aware, but it, it's also largely uh, there's a, a tremendous corporate um, 
um, investment in this whole thing and has been since, since the beginning. How close is the relationship with, uh, with ETs? I think in, in many cases it's extremely close and there's been um, continuous liaison, certainly with the more um, human types that have our best interest at heart. That's been going on for a very long time. Tell me more and, about you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. Say again. What's your, your question? I was going to ask you a little bit more about, about, about Roswell and, uh, and that crash there, but I didn't want to interrupt your train of thought. Um, you can interrupt my train of thought. George, you're, you're welcome. Um, Roswell, well, I think, you know, there's so much talk about Roswell, so many books on it now. Everyone has different opinions and things, but it certainly happened. And um, what, what more can one say? So many military and um, civilian witnesses have come forward, and, uh, you know, some of generals of even you know, uh, highly qualified military personnel, has, uh, like General Jabose, have signed affidavits saying, saying it happened. I don't know. What more people want other than nice photographs of aliens and details of communications and so forth, but I'm sure that will be forthcoming uh, in, in due course. I've always wondered, if we shot them down, why did they didn't come back with a vengeance to pick up their dead occupants, or maybe they were robots? Who knows? There, there, has, there was one case I, I was told about by a, a military source, uh, the same military source that gave me that information I, I recounted earlier about the hybridization program, that there was an incident when the aliens actually demonstrated. I think the demonstration was over Farmington in New Mexico in, in the late 40s, early 50s. I forget the exact date. There was a famous thing when, when, when there were hundreds of these things seen in the skies. And... This really put the wind up the military because they were actually studying. They had they had craft. They had some bodies, and the aliens insisted that some of their colleagues um, and corpses should be returned, and they were because the military feared that there would be more mass demonstrations around the world uh, by complaining aliens. Uh, huh. So there were there were there was liaison going on, and and I I gather that bodies were 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 returned to them in some cases. But the truth revealed all at once would be far too shocking, and there are many reasons for this. First of all, there are disturbing aspects. Many people have lost their lives um, in the military, for example, since the late 40s, maybe even during World War II when they've opened fire on some of these craft, and uh, there has been retaliation on a very large scale. That's one of the things that um, I concentrate on in Need to Know, which was published in the States in, in 2007. So I hope uh, that later in the program we can uh, get up to date with uh, some, some more recent developments. But yes. um, for sure, I would say conservatively that hundreds of military pilots have lost their lives in the pursuit of um, unknown flying objects. Is it your opinion, Timothy, that if the pilots did not take an aggressive stance toward the UFO, that they might not have been harmed, or would they have anyway? I think you're, 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 you're right there, because in April, May 1947, when the German team headed by von Braun started developing the captured V-2 rockets and launching them from New Mexico, from White Sands, mm -hmm. there were frequently occasions when discs, flying discs, were seen buzzing around the rockets. And on at least one occasion, two occasions of which I'm aware, rockets were brought down prematurely and um, destroyed. And this led to retaliation by our military. The United States Army Air Forces, as they were then known, were sent up to try and shoot down the flying discs, and they were successful, because I'm convinced that Roswell and several other incidents were due to craft which had been attacked by uh, military aircraft. Now, people say to me, well, Tim, that's rather unlikely. 
these craft have got such advanced technology and they're highly advanced this and that, and there's no way that we could, we could uh, shoot them down. Surely they would be invulnerable to whatever we had to throw at them. Right. You would think that, at least. <clears throat> you would think that, George, but not so. What I've been told by, by uh, reliable sources is that they can cope with anything electronic that is uh, fired at them, like uh, electronically guided missiles, but they are not so hot on dealing with cannon shells. And th this is what brought them down, apparently. And I, guess, led... I guess it's, it's probably as technology advances, they are so far advanced, it's like a little slingshot, and they probably don't even know what it is. Right. And you see, there were... There was then retaliation by the spacecraft because all over the world, not just in the United States, as people think, but all over the world, there were, in 1947, a very alarming series of aircraft accidents, not just involving military aircraft, but civilian airliners. And Often, airliners were unable to unstick, as they say in aviation parlance, unable to get off the runway and just crashed into flames at the end of the runway, killing passengers and crew. And this happened on a number of occasions. Planes were, as it were, made to collide with each other. There was a horrendous series of incidents, and Truman called it an investigation. There was a crisis meetings about all this which some of this has been released uh, through the public record. And you can understand how th this information, if, if we were told about that, I can talk about it, we can talk about it, but if that came out from, um, say, President Obama, that, you know, there's been a conflict, and furthermore, that there still is a conflict going on with some alien species, how do you think we would react? Um, oh my I, I really think it's got to be, it's got to be gradual. Yeah, I think so too. You you have a passion for aviation, which yes, is probably one of the reasons that pushed you in the direction you've gone with UFO investigations, has it? Absolutely, absolutely, and it was due to an American cousin that I became uh, involved in in UFO research. Uh, this was a guy, Edmund C. Berkeley, uh, a second cousin of mine, who actually was the first person in the United States, I believe, to produce a, mag a magazine on computing. And it was called Computers and Automation, I believe. And our, our members of the family thought it was all quite nuts, the, the, the idea of computers and so forth. But this man was, was decades ahead of his time. And I'll never forget the time that uh, he came to our house and said, uh, Timothy, you like airplanes? You need to know about flying saucers. So he sent me The Flying Sources of Real by Major Donald Kehoe, and that was it. Here were reports by military pilots, by airline pilots, and people often say radar doesn't make much difference. That's absolute nonsense. Now, in the early days, certainly in the 40s and 50s, radar was vulnerable to things like anaprop, anomalous prop radar propagation. But I can tell you that over the years, radar is incredibly sophisticated. A long time ago, I learned that uh, from a, a, a Royal Navy source over here that the Americans had radar capable of identifying what engine an aircraft um, was actually using. Uh, Soviet bombers, for example, they, they would identify the make of engine and they, they would know that that, that, that was a, a bomber or a, a fighter plane or reconnaissance or whatever. And that was, I would say, at least 20 years ago. So radar has confirmed many of the thousands of reports from military and airline pilots, and all of them get mercilessly ridiculed or threatened, as, as we're all well aware and um, my hat off to Leslie Kane for her new book, which I have before me, mm -hmm. um, UFOs, generals, pilots, and government officials go on the record because she's, she's highlighted uh, this important aspect, as indeed I did with, with Need to Know. I concentrated on, on a lot of pilot cases and military cases, generals, and so forth. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, you know, before we start talking about UFOs, maybe you should tell us, have you got any dirt on all those musicians, McCartney, Rod Stewart, you too? 
<laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> now you want to share. Okay. Uh, yeah. I had a chance to, you know, Tim and I have known each other a long time, but I had a chance to see him in Denver at this year's MUFON Symposium where he uh, spoke. Uh, we had a chance to chat afterward. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, uh, Tim, I was just blown away by your talk. Um, and then I got your the, your new book, Need to Know, and wow, I, I'm, is this a fair way to describe it? I you examine you re-examine a lot of really well known cases and topics like Roswell and the DC overflights and things of those sort. But you you fill in the blanks. I mean, looking at you look at this stuff in a whole different way uh, with a whole bunch of new information. Is that an Absolutely. accurate description? Absolutely. That's a very good uh, evaluation, George. Thanks. And um, by the way, um, you know, I, I was checking back on my interviews, and uh, the last interview that I did with you was on 30th of March of 1990 on KLAS TV, Las Vegas. Do you remember That's, that? I do. I do indeed. I, I still have the tape. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, that goes back a ways. Yeah. You're, you're dating me. Um, so it, it, let's start this way in discussing your book and your new findings. Um, let's say there's a cover-up, I mean, that we've been lied to. I mean, I believe it, you believe it, most of our audience believes it. Now what, though? I mean, how does it make a difference in our everyday lives once you reach that conclusion? And what do you do with it? It's a very good question, George, and I've pondered about that over many years. One thing I have sort of come to the conclusion is that how many of us, who are in favor of full disclosure seriously consider that uh, those elements of the government, and they are few and far between, relatively speaking, in the United States government and elsewhere who, who are in the know, do you seriously think we are going to get the whole picture if they do come out with what people assume might be the truth? I seriously doubt it. It's going to be spin. So I don't think that um, unadulterated disclosure is, is really going to do that much good, quite frankly. Well, as if it would ever happen anyway. Well, quite. But there will be, I'm quite sure. I mean, there's no way they can sit on all this stuff forever. So they've got to say something, um, maybe periodically, uh, maybe um, – as Nick Pope has suggested, it'll come out through through uh, the SETI program. Hey, guys, you know, we've really discovered there are, there are Earth-like planets. And, yeah, you know, there, we seem to have detected some communications between them. And, you know, there may well have been visits here already and that sort of thing. And sort of kind of casual. Dribble it out a piece of it at a time, uh, which is a lot of people believe that's the way it's going now. Well... That's what I have been told by, by my sources, that uh, gradual disclosure is, is the wisest agenda. And I might not have gone, gone with that, you know, 20 years ago, but now I think probably that, probably that is the best way for the sake of, of all sorts of uh, situations. You know, the economy, um, you can imagine the stock market, uh, just general sort of... Um, Pandemonium, you know. Hi, what are the, you know? Hey, what are these? What are these guys doing here? You know, are they hostile and so on and so forth? Um, so, it, it, I think it has. And the, the church, of course, is another thing. You know, the religious aspects of this subject um, must never be overlooked. I mean, uh, the church is going to be profoundly affected by by all this. Just you know what happens when? Uh, you know what happens? I'm sorry to, to interrupt you. Um, no, no, go ahead. Um, it, what happens when l people like yourself or me express uh, some reservations about anything short of total and absolute and immediate disclosure? Mm -hmm. People jump up and down and pound their chest and point at you. And, you know, I would imagine there are people listening to this program now who say, we deserve the truth, we need to know the truth, and, yep. and nothing short of full and immediate disclosure is going to do. But, you know, as you and I have chatted privately, when you've been in this stuff for a long time, you start yep. thinking about it, and and there would be repercussions, there would be consequences, and uh, and and but you know that that's a tough one to, for people to swallow. Some people yeah. who who sort of have the uh, the religious fervor about UFOs, you know. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Tim, I, I want to go over. You, you sort of rewrite uh, ufological history. I was particularly uh, stunned by this uh, this document, this telegram that you dug up regarding uh, Benito Mussolini. Tell me about that. Oh, right. Well, 
Back in 1933, there was apparently the landing of an unknown craft on Italian soil. And uh, this led to the establishment of probably the world's first top-secret UFO research outfit, and it was called Special Research Group Number 33, or RS 33. And um, it happened in June of 1933 when, when this um, unknown craft landed on, on Italian soil. And this agency was set up. Um, Mussolini himself had a great interest in these events, being a pilot himself, um, especially when later on uh, there were many sightings um, in Italy of these unknown flying objects, um, including um, one in 1936 when pilots were chasing these things and um, got fairly near, but of course they always dashed off uh, as, as they do. But um, Marconi was, was one of the... Uh, committee on this top secret panel, interestingly, the great engineer. Um, although, curiously, he didn't take that great an interest in the phenomenon, and he often, uh, you know, wasn't present at, at all the meetings. But um, definitely, I, I find that very, very interesting, that there was a top secret research group in Italy as early as 1933. In, in your book, there's a copy of this, uh, this telegram, highly yes. confidential Italian government telegram, Yep. Um, on the personal order of Il Duce. Yeah. And what does it say? Absolutely no mention is to be made of the alleged landing of an unknown aircraft on national soil. The same applies to today's news due for publication by the Stefani Agency and individual journalists. Maximum penalty for non-compliance will be enforced by the Tribunal for Straight State Security. You know, it makes me wonder is whether Mussolini had a chance to talk about this stuff with his uh, his ally Hitler in in later years. <laughs> I've, I've I've no idea, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. But um, interestingly, he he made um, quite a, a prescient uh, comment. He said, you know, that the Americans shouldn't worry too much about. Uh, um, uh, foreigners landing on their soil, but uh, he, he, he was he, he commented that um, just before this wasn't that long before February of 1942, when um, uh, there were these extraordinary sightings over Los Angeles, witnessed by well over a million people. You know the five-hour air alarm, which I think you're all familiar with, during which 1,430 rounds of um, anti-aircraft shells were fired at these things in the sky with absolutely no effect whatsoever. But, and um, I think it's interesting that, that, that Mussolini sort of, um, sort of was, was interested in this before, before it actually happened. You know, he, 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 he thought there might be um, uh, the, the chance of something like that happening. Tell me this. Uh, uh, quote, I've got the quote here, actually, George. Sure. Um, yeah. um, this was a speech by Mussolini uh, actually, it was a year. It was a year before before February 1942. He said the United States are far more likely to be invaded not by soldiers of the Axis, but by the not so well known but warlike inhabitants of the planet Mars, who will come down out of space in their unimaginable flying fortresses. So, I mean, that's almost certainly the first uh, official reference to possible alien spaceships. Um, yeah. And uh, I. As I say, it was prescient in that a year later, something like that happened. And it did lead, as you, you were m mentioning before the break, uh, to a conflict situation which continues to this day with some alien species, I am absolutely convinced. Do you think the first signs of the conflict um, uh, were in World War II with what we had known as Foo Fighters, although they ne never actually fired on American – they didn't fire on our planes, did they? Did they interfere well, with our planes then? What I can say is is that certainly there were when we talk about Foo Fighters, people think in terms of sort of amorphous blobs of light that followed uh, aircraft, uh, particularly during bombing missions, and sometimes stalled the engines. They certainly did that with with uh, B seventeen bombers and things like that. Happened many on on, on a number of occasions, but um, the, I, I, again. Just before the end of the Second World War, there's an interesting story. Someone I, I spoke to, and it, it, it's come out for the first time in my book, um, a free French Air Force pilot actually um, in, was sent up. Um, the, uh, this was at, uh, at, Self, at Selfridge Field, Mount Clements, near um, Detroit, in July of 1945. And... Um, 
there were massive sightings of what the what the, the military thought were the Fugo balloons, some of which actually were, were you know, the, these were balloons launched uh, from Japan, and they traveled right across the Pacific, and a few of them exploded, and uh, most of them sort of crashed on um, on the West Coast. Do you think that there is a possibility that, that in that Los Angeles, that famous Los Angeles case, 1942, the whole country has war jitters, we're worried about the, you know, the Japanese invading or flying over sure. and bombing us, and, and so the something was flying over Los Angeles, I think it was February 1942, and, and uh, all hell broke loose, and we're firing off all these yeah. uh, guns, shooting at things in the sky. Yes. Do you think it's possible that we shot something down then? Well, something came down, that's for sure. Um, and it was it was subsequently covered up from the next edition of one of the Los Angeles papers. Whether it was an American plane knocked down by friendly fire or what, we, we don't know. I, I would not be surprised if something was shot down. But what I do know is that from uh, from from that time onward, the the American Army Air Forces renewed their resolve to try and get some of these more of these things down. And they succeeded in 1947. What happened was that when when uh, the V-2 rockets, which were being uh, launched from White Sands Proving Grounds, New Mexico, um, with Werner von Braun and his team of captured uh, German scientists, of course, and they brought the rockets over. The Russians got some as well, but the Americans got the best team of scientists. And, of course, they, they, they were developing the V-2s for the American space program. And in May of 1947, when I, one of the very first uh, V-2s was sent up, a, a strange disk was seen sort of zooming around uh, one of the, this, this V-2. And this has been confirmed by the actual um, director, the commanding officer of White Sands at that time, that strange phenomena were responsible for bringing down uh, in, ahead of its its normal um, the area where it was supposed to actually uh, come down a V two rocket and this was on fifteenth of May. Peculiar phenomena were blamed for the you know the unexplained premature flight of the V two, and this led to a renewed resolve to try and uh, bring more of these things down, and they did succeed. And uh, it started May, June, continuing on into July and further on. What happened is we started firing at these things, and I believe several were brought down, leading to the so-called Roswell incident. There might well have been additional things. There was more than one craft involved, and they were seen over a period of days. And I've reproduced newspaper articles from the period, thanks to a great guy, John Andy Kistner, a former state representative for Las Cruces, who was in the aerospace business, who's given me a great deal of, of help with this aspect uh, of my book, and I wouldn't have, have been able to do it were it not for his uh, fantastic research over, over many years. And uh, he's dug up tons of stuff. And what happened when the United States Army Air Forces, as they were known uh, prior to September of 1947, began firing at these things. We brought some of these these craft down. And the ones that, that were, were, were no, involved in the so-called Roswell incident took several days, actually, to come down. They, they were actually seen wobbling around the sky for, for some period. And there were many reports by people. And um, this led to an unprecedented wave of attacks. Um, on our aircraft, and I'm not just talking about United States, worldwide there was a wave of aircraft disasters involving military planes, not just those that had been sent up to intercept, but, but just ordinary aircraft as well, including airliners, many of which could not get off the ground. They could not unstick, as they say in the, in the aviation trade. Um, and the, 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 the official explanations were that these, these aircraft were running, simply running out of fuel. Well, you know, you don't get that many planes running out of fuel after they've just uh, taken off. And this was world, worldwide, hundreds. And I've cited probably about, a, I don't know how many, maybe, maybe uh, 50, 60, something like that. But there were, there were hundreds all over the world. And Truman ordered an, an inquiry. The government was panicking about this situation, and I'm convinced that's because uh, it was retaliation by some of the UFOs for the fact that we'd shot down some of their 
discs. Yeah, it's a very disturbing uh, account when you when you look at all of these uh, newspaper clippings, one right after another. Yeah. At this time period, round the world series of plane wrecks kills 180 in the Las Cruces Sun, New Mexico, and then yep. a follow up in the New York Times. Tim, uh, you essentially believe there was a a shooting war, and you look at these headlines about all these uh, these crashes, and it's it, it's before, during, and after the Roswell thing. So essentially. You're saying Roswell was one incident of many. Well, I don't know how many uh, recoveries there were, George, but um, I certainly think there were some during the First World War, which I've mentioned uh, before. In fact, I've mentioned in previous books, uh, but, um, I've added a, a few more. Um, there was certainly one in, 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 uh, that came down in New Mexico um, in August, in the late summer of, of 1945, uh, which, which I've discussed uh, briefly, came down in a little town of San Antonito, near San Antonio, uh, New Mexico. And um, this was taken away by the army. And there have been other incidents. There's one in Ohio, Ohio in 1944. Whether these were shot down or not, I do not know. But Roswell was not the first. But um, you're, you're talking about the evidence. How can we prove this? Well, I think the proof is contained in many of the newspaper articles of that period, the contemporary news articles from local papers to the New York Times. I mean, this was worldwide. There was a situation that pilots were reporting discs in the sky. Um, There were accidents happening all the time around that period, many of them completely unexplained. And incidentally, um, later on, we, we might come to this, but um, the, the, defense, US, the official U.S. Defense Department accident statistics, which, um, which I've got thanks to Richard Hall, who, um, the, Richard H. Hall, the, the great uh, in, investigator, um, who was given them by Dr. Alevo Fontes. There were something like, uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly, but from 1952 to October of 1956, there were about 1,700 unexplained accidents involving interceptor aircraft the ty- of the type that would be used to intercept chase uh, UFOs just from that period. So if we were to look at the records, the way to prove it would be to look at the military records of, of these many, many accidents, and I think it would be very, very interesting indeed uh, if, we can, if we can get all those. Let's I focus mean, what- on Roswell for a couple of minutes. You write in your book... And from the outset, Roswell has also been the subject of an intensive counterintelligence campaign using every conceivable trick or tradecraft by fair means or foul, such as threatening and discrediting witnesses and fabricating counter evidence. That's right. That's that's pretty tough to to cut through it because these guys who do this stuff are good at it, aren't they? Well, of course. It's their profession. You know, counterintelligence, um, for example, uh, the Air Force... uh, Office of Special Investigations, AFOSI, uh, has been involved uh, for, for many, many years. Um, and there are thousands of people involved in counterintelligence uh, deception programs um, to put out uh, false information to, and discrediting witnesses and so on. It still, it still goes on, and it's, it can be very, very effective indeed. Also, you have um, uh, the media can be influenced by people in counterintelligence. It's called perception management. Uh, we call it news management over here. Um, it's rather a rather sort of <laughs> devious method of doing things, but it is done. If uh, spin you can, is another word, just altering a few facts, discrediting witnesses, um, it's 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 quite easy and it's very very effective. You know what's amazing to me? You've dug up all these newspaper articles that uh, that have just never been mentioned in this context before. That sure seemed to paint a pattern right before Roswell that things were going on in the sky that could have yeah. been related to this crash. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things you mentioned in the book is this discrepancy about when Mac Brazel actually reported finding the wreckage that we know today as the Roswell incident. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, I don't know exactly, George, quite frankly, without, without going through all, the, all the, you know, the facts and figures and everything. But what, what I do know is that in around the 26th, 27th, 28th of June in New Mexico, 
a number of these discs were seen wobbling around the skies. Uh, they, were, they were described as sailing or falling objects. And, uh, for example, there's the El Paso Times of 28th of June, which I've, I've got in front of me here, and it, it talks about um, uh, conjecture as to whether the falling objects had any relation to the mysterious flying discs which had been variously reported. And, um, and in fact, uh, there, there, there was a search parties were sent from White Sands in attempts to locate the objects or to secure in additional information. And of course, they eventually they, they, they eventually got them. But uh, maybe the rancher was the first to report one of the sites. I think probably that's uh, what, what what may have happened. There were several sites. I'm, I'm still in. There's still some doubt about the exact uh, um, exact location of the sites. There might have. Some people say there were two. Some people say there were even three. There's still some confusion about that. But um, a lot more information is is coming out now. And of course, we have Walter Hout, who who, who uh, um, apparently signed a sort of. Uh, uh, like what amounts to a deathbed confession that he himself, uh, he was the press officer for the United States Army Air Forces at uh, Roswell Army Airfield at the time. And, um, you know, finally, after his death, we learned that he'd actually um, had a glimpse of uh, the alien uh, beings themselves recovered in, in one of these incidents. So, you know, the, the, the truth is sort of gradually emerging over the years, more and more people are coming forward, and um, I've introduced a f several more witnesses, people like uh, the, the Polish biophysicist, who together with uh, a small team of, of scientists, of biophysicists from, from uh, Britain, from France and Italy, and this was a Polish guy, were actually shown at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory back in April of 1977, the JPL at Pasadena, they were taken down to a, a, a vault three levels below ground and shown in this top secret area um, remains of some of the alien beings found in New Mexico. No specifics were given, but uh, this biophysicist describes in great detail um, his opinion that this was not the, the skeletal structure that he examined was neither that of a chimpanzee nor a small child, but uh, he, there was also part, a large part of the skull that uh, were exhibited in this uh, top secret room, and um, I, I find that testimony very, very compelling indeed. I remember your your presentation in in Denver that you you mentioned this and I found it fascinating. I think you used a pseudonym for this Polish scientist. Do you know his real name? Dr. Chris. Dr. No, Chris. I don't, but I know who does. And, and is one, he still one day, alive? One day I'll get to meet him, I'm sure. You think he's, he is still alive then? Oh, yes. Um, another, you know, something that sort of separates you from a lot of the UFO researchers is your access to really high-level military folks, uh, both in Britain there and in the United States. And one of those who helped sort of put, um, put uh, things in perspective about Roswell for you is someone I've also spoken to uh, over the years. His name is uh, Brigadier General Arthur Exxon. Tell me uh, what he was able to, what light he was able to shed on the I Roswell met, mystery. I, I have to say, uh, George, I never met uh, General Exxon. So you, the the uh, I cite information. His testimony. It was it was it was Kevin, uh, Schmidt and Randall who, who who were the first to 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 come out with a lot of his information, I believe, and they published that in uh, one of their first books on Roswell. How, how does it relate to what you've written? in this book about Roswell? I think some of it uh, relates very much so. Um, I, find it, I find his testimony very compelling, but often these guys uh, might sort of provide, uh, they might in, in provide diversionary information, shall we say, just to, to protect themselves or to protect some other people or anything. So it, it's, you know, when military people come up with information, there's, it often is accompanied with disinformation, particularly when you come to exact areas where things were recovered and things like that. I mean, they don't want people going out to these places and sort of um, combing them, because there's, there's, there's more definitely more than one crash site involved in the Roswell thing, and um, there's, there's quite a bit of new testimony that's uh, been provided. But as I say, that was, that was just one. Uh, Werner von Braun uh, apparently was also um, shown some of the recovered bodies, according to uh, Clark McClelland, who, who was a NASA aerospace engineer. 
And he kindly provided me with some information, and uh, he chatted to Do uh, Von Braun about Roswell, and he allegedly said, I'm quoting uh, Clark here, he says that uh, he and certain of his associates have been taken to the crash site after most of the military were pulled back. Uh, he told me the craft did not appear to be made of metal as we know metal on Earth. Almost seemed to be created from something biological. And um, the bodies, he said, were temporarily being kept in a nearby medical tent, small, very frail, and had large heads and large eyes. And uh, he, he said that his inspection of the debris had even him puzzled, very thin, aluminum-colored like silvery chewing gum wrappers, very light and extremely strong. Well, we've heard that before from, from other people, of course. And he says that uh, the, the interior of the craft was nearly bare of equipment, as if the creatures and craft were part of a single unit. So that's, that's someone else. And um, also there's, there's a number of other witnesses um, who are cited, like Sergeant Robbins, which um, I've gone into in, in some detail. I don't know how many... We, we don't need to go into the whole story here. but um. Tim, Tell me this, Tim. Uh, you mentioned yeah. that, you know, the shooting war had been going on before Roswell, during and, and yes. after. Yes. You mentioned a couple of minutes ago these, these figures compiled by Richard Hall about uh, unusual... Well, by, compiled uh, by the United States Defense Department. Yes, there were... There were I, I can get hold of these statistics um, in a minute. Um, um, but, I mean, the question I, I is how long... I have them here, yeah. Sure. How long did this shooting war go on? And these these numbers think, indicated that you mentioned earlier think, that it was from fifty two to fifty six. So it, it, this it, shoot. I think it continues to this day. Uh, and uh, I mean, do you have recent evidence, uh, recent suggestions, or testimony that the, that we're still shooting at you, at each other? Oh gosh, yes. I mean, there's there's all sorts of reports of people, you know, letting loose with with uh, like sidewinder missiles at these things. Um, it continues, but I, th I would say generally, um, for example, in 1998, uh, I think it was in, in, um, in China, Ch uh, Chinese uh, uh, Air Force plane was sent up to intercept a UFO, and he got the thing in his sights, and he requested permission to fire at it, but uh, ground control forbade him to fire at it. So I think probably there's a lot of common sense uh, in <laughs> involved in situations, especially when one realizes that there have been these awful accidents. Um, it, tell the audience who Lord Hill Nort Norton is, and uh, and um, yes, well, and what um, he's told you. He, uh, well, he was an admiral of the fleet. He was former chief of the defense staff of the United States government, and he was also chairman of the NATO military committee. He died a few years ago, but uh, he was enormously interested in the subject. He helped me a great deal over the years. He himself had not, and I, I do believe him on this, um, ha had not been exposed to any great secrets about the subject at all. He, he did all he could after, after he retired to find out, but, um, and he did discover some things. But um, it's interesting that someone in a very high position like, like that, as, you know, former chief of defense staff, had, not, he had no exposure, as they say um, in the military, to, to, to the subject, officially at any rate. Ever any discussion with him or other uh, British military officials about the possibility of, uh, and I don't know the answer to this, I'm just asking off the cuff, but whether or not there is a British Roswell? Did you ever, did, this, is, this question was sent in by one of the listeners, uh, yeah. the program, a few days ago, but is there any indication that the British military forces tried to shoot him down and, and may have succeeded? Um, I, I, I wouldn't doubt it. I have no firm information myself about that. There are various rumors of, of, of incidents, but I have no solid information, you know, to sort of base any opinion on at the moment about that. But what I do know is I'm quite sure there has been a conflict situation um, and that it, it has been covered up. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that many British military aircraft have, have disappeared, pilots never found, aircraft never found, that sort of thing, as just as they have um, in, in the United States and, and other countries. Now, I've got these statistics in front of me from the book. Um, there were, from 1952 until the end of October 56, 18,662 major accidents of military aircraft, most of those involving high-performance uh, interceptors of the type that would be used to chase uh, the flying disks. Now, that's an extraordinary number of major accidents. And um, of that total, 56 
percent were found to be caused by pilot error, eight percent by ground crew or other personnel failure, twenty three percent failure of parts and equipment, and the actual figure of unexplained um, accidents is 9.5, which amounts to 1,773 accidents due to unknown factors. Now, wouldn't it be interesting to research all those cases involving unknown factors? Perhaps uh, some someone should uh, file a freedom of inf- information request about that. Uh, consider it done. Let's we'll, we'll get on that. <laughs> Um, tell me, uh, what about the ghost rockets before we leave this period? After yeah. World War II, these, these, this phenomenon is known as ghost rockets in, yeah. uh, over Scandinavian countries. A lot of folks thought they were just regular missiles. Um, what, what's your new take on that that you express in the book? Well, first of all, you, you know, uh, my book has a foreword by Bill Gunston, who is one of the world's foremost aviation historians. And he absolutely assures me that the, whatever the ghost rockets were, um, they were not Russian rockets using captured German equipment. That was the prevailing theory of the intelligence people and the military at that time. Often, you know, rockets need guiding vanes. You know, you, 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 need, you need some kind of thing to, to direct them. Um, these missiles that were seen frequently had absolutely no, no, no uh, fins or vanes or anything like that. And they often moved just completely different from from um, the way rockets move. They were sometimes, you know, cr- uh, seen sort of diving and climbing, other times proceeding in, in a relatively leisurely sort of, of manner. And there were actually accidents. I mean, this was going on not just in, in Scandinavia, though particularly in Scandinavia, but it was around the world, actually. There were reports from India, Turkey, many other countries, Greece. And um, the incidents of, of – there were a number of aircraft accidents, as a matter of fact, um, quite, quite disturbing. And I've, I've, um, I've, I've reproduced um, a headline from the uh, – I believe it's the New York Times here, Ghost Rockets. Plane hits rocket, three Swedes killed. And um, so, you see, there were a number of disturbing incidents then, and uh, that some of these – these things were seen diving into lakes as well. We don't know what was going on there at all. And as I say, the consensus at first was, was that these were Russian rockets, but they were not. They were, and and they obviously weren't ordinary rockets of any of any kind. One of the incidents that uh, that really caught my eye in the book is uh, it on uh, it's August 1947. This B-25 Mitchell uh, twin-engine bomber crashed near Kelso, Washington, killing the pilots, Captain. William Davidson and Lieutenant Frank Brown, they were intelligence officers, yeah. and uh, and I guess apparently they were returning from Tacoma, Washington, where they'd interviewed, of all people, Kenneth Arnold. Kenneth Arnold the, the, and Captain Ed Smith, that's right, who, who'd both been witnesses to UFO sightings uh, earlier that summer. This was this became known as the what I refer to as the, as, as the sinister Maury Island incident of 21st of June, which is a, a, a very strange episode, and... Um, I, um, I can, I, I, you know, there is a there is a very good book um, by by Ken Thomas. Um, if I, uh, there's a, it's called uh, Maury Island UFO: The Chrisman Cons- Conspiracy by Ken Thomas, um, published by Illuminate Press, and um, I find that absolutely fascinating. Yeah, the Chrisman name pops up in some interesting places. When we come back, we'll uh, we'll look a little bit more into this incident as well as the infamous. Uh, Washington, D.C. overflights and some new information there. You know, Tim, we'll get back to some specifics. I guess what I'd be wondering is, uh, you know, given the fact that uh, that from everything we know about UFOs, wherever they're from, other planets or dimensions or whatever, that they're so far technically advanced, uh, so far beyond what we have, why haven't they just wiped us out? If if we're shooting at them, they're shooting at us, uh, you'd presume they could do a lot more damage than they've done. Absolutely, I, I, I agree with you, and, and this makes me very skeptical about about the whole uh, possibility. But uh, at the same time, there have been incidents where we have shot at these craft, and in some cases, have brought them down. Certainly, in the early days, my understanding is that uh, that even our technology has been developed to the extent that we now have very, very uh, capable weaponry to deal with some uh, craft, but I'm quite sure that should, you know, they they could wipe us out if they wanted to, no question about it. 
Well, you you know, maybe then you get into stories like about Area 51 and Bob yeah. Lazar and Phil yeah. Corso and uh-huh. things like that, that we've uh, we've been able to recover this technology. Maybe exactly. we've lessened the gap over the years. Exactly. That's uh, absolutely. I'm with you 100 percent on that one, George. Um, let's talk about for a minute about the uh, the D.C. overflights in July 1952. It's one of the most famous UFO episodes ever series of ufos seen over washington sensitive areas over the capital um military jets are scrambled they go after these things they can't catch them uh, that's the official story becomes all oh, the radar operators who saw these things uh, it was just caused by a temperature inversion that's right G- yeah. give me your take on that story and and uh, and tell the audience the kinds of new information that you've uh, that you've acquired for this book that uh, that puts it in a different light well, just, you know, to take one example, um, it, it, the, the sort of over, over the, the sort of general impression one gets is that these were just blobs in the sky and, and they sometimes showed on radar and other times not. But in fact, sometimes quite large objects were seen quite, quite clearly, such as um, there was one object about 100 feet long, which uh, hung in the air cigar-shaped craft. Um, this, was, this was leading up to Washington, uh, the D.C. sightings. And then um, at one stage, um, sh- shortly after objects were seen heading towards D.C., over 500 people on the ground observed uh, this strange object hovering north-northwest of the city, uh, including a physics professor from George Washington University who says that during the eight minutes this object was in sight, it, st- it came down so low that downtown buildings were obscured from his view. So that, I find, a- an interesting um, aspect of, of the, the D.C. sightings, that one actually came down that low. You talked about these these giant craft. I think I can't remember where it is exactly in in the book, but I thought it was in relation to the Washington D.C. Yeah. Uh, overflights, where these things like like the giant craft from Independence Day or something were were, were way up in the sky. That's absolutely or, right. This is according to Major Donald Kehoe, who who was a, a hero of mine, and he was responsible um, indirectly for for stimulating my interest in the subject back in 1955. He discovered that um, during the period UFOs were being tracked in the D.C. area, gigantic objects were tracked orbiting Earth. Two of them, he says, came down between Washington and Baltimore and hovered at around 79,000 feet. And this is what uh, he, he, he told uh, journalist Bob Pratt, whom I knew as a very, very good journalist. This is what Kehoe says. I... I, I, I um, I talked with one of the pilots who was in the jet squadron that was trying to get up near one of those things, and he said, I've never been more terrified in my life. Just to look at that thing, you could tell that you'd be crazy to go up there and try and shoot at it. Thank God we couldn't get up that close. Later on, he had a friend who told me, yeah, I was there and I was scared too. I don't know any of the pilots that were involved who weren't scared just seeing those huge damn things. Like that. But it's so, it is sort of like the imagery from Independence Day; those yes. gigantic mile long ships, and the smaller Absolutely. ones would, yeah. You know, I remember uh, reading your your book above top secret long ago, and there was a photo of Winston Churchill in there, and a quote from him as saying, you know, ordering uh, the Ministry of Defense, I guess, hey, what's the deal on the UFOs? But until I read this new book, I didn't understand the context. His comments were were inspired by the DC overflights, or was it something else? Yes. It was by the DC overflights. Absolutely. What does all this stuff about flying saucers mean? You know, what's what's uh, what's the truth? Let me have a report at your convenience. I'm, uh, that's off the top of my head. It was something like that, and they came back. Prime Minister, don't worry. Uh, we've we've made an investigation in conjunction with the Americans. They were re- referring, of course, to the top secret flying saucers working party, as it was called in Great Britain. Wonderful title, in, which was established in 1950. Uh, for one year, uh, they liaised with the Americans, and the object of the exercise, in my opinion, was the Americans were trying to get the Brits to discredit as many, especially the really good caliber sightings coming from pilots. I mean, we had sightings here in the 50s, in the very early 50s, prior to Washington, that um, uh, there were sightings over Farnborough, um, sort of major test pilots were seeing these things at, at, Farm, at Farnborough, the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough in Hampshire. And um, at low level, a craft came right over, I've, I've described this in the book, came right over the airfield seen by many officers, including these test pilots, on the ground. And this thing wasn't, it was at about, 
I don't know, no more than a thousand feet, something like that. And it was it was metallic. It was making uh, crackling sounds. There was a smell of ozone. There was a humming sound, and so on and so forth. And they, when they all the, the people from the Flying Saucers Working Party came to investigate, they took details very seriously and everything. And officially, the report was that the pilots had mistaken um, just conventional aircraft. So they were discredited. They were absolutely livid when they found out later on when, when the, the British government uh, released uh, some of these reports about the British flying saucers. Wasn't there, uh, wasn't there, wasn't there something involving Lord Montbatten? Uh, he had an interest in the phenomena, maybe something about something landing at his, in his, on his home? Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, gosh, I, I, this, was, this was in the mid-1950s. I think it was around 1955-56 when, um, according to one of his staff, a craft came down and a sort of section lowered from it and a humanoid was seen. And um, this witness was actually sort of knocked off his bicycle in, in shock. It was in snow at that time. And he, went, he, he was encouraged to tell his boss, Lord Mountbatten, who came out to the site with him and saw the tracks uh, of the bicycle where it had come down and everything, and um, Mountbatten believed that story. Um, it's just one of many such stories, and I think certainly that in uh, inspired his interest, though I'm, I'm quite sure, according to my information, Mountbatten had a sighting um, in the Pacific Ocean during World War II. I remember, uh, and maybe it's from this book, maybe it's from an earlier book, that uh, that there was some suspicion that Montbatten may have been a source for Dorothy Kilgallen, the American journalist yes. who, who who was pursuing the UFO yes. mystery. I wouldn't be at all surprised. I don't know for sure, but um, I, I think it's quite likely. Uh, while we're on the subject of, of British uh, UFO incidents and famous cases, the Rendlesham Forest case. Um, I don't know if you heard earlier uh, today in this program, I mentioned that Jacques Vallée had been in town here with the Remote Viewers Association, and I'd read something from Dr. Vallée about Rendlesham. He said that, uh, that he, he was suspicious about that case because he, he believes that radar operators at this military base – uh, near where this incident had occurred, had been told a couple of days beforehand, hey, uh, keep an eye on the sea or w what's going to come from the sea, his suspicion being that it may have been a manufactured incident. What's your take? Well, uh, well, I don't know is the answer to that. I mean, that may there may be some truth in that. What I can tell you is that about 10 days prior to the craft coming down, because Roswell... Uh, so, sorry, the, the uh, Rendlesham Forest case, which uh, involved uh, the twin U.S. Air Force bases of Bentwaters and Woodbridge, took place st starting on sort of Christmas night, 25, 26, 27, 20. It was going on for several nights. And whatever it was, this thing came came right down so low that the, 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 the um, U.S. Air Force security policemen um, actually uh, were able to touch it at one stage uh, with their feet. They were they were following it around the forest. I mean, it's an, it's an incredible case. And Nick Pope, who who headed the UFO um, department uh, in the Ministry of Defence from 1991 to 1994, he's absolutely convinced that uh, this was from somewhere else. Um, and at one stage, um, un unofficially, at one stage, this craft or one of the craft was beaming down lights at the nuclear weapons storage area um, at these U.S. Air Force bases. And there were more nuclear weapons stored in Suffolk in Great Britain than anywhere else in, in, in Europe at that time in December of 1980. But I'd also like to add, George, that on the 15th of December, this is 10 days prior to Woodbridge bent waters, an identical craft was seen right over my area. I saw it myself, not for long, unfortunately, and it was one of those rare occasions when I didn't have a camera with me or a movie camera. But I did see this brilliant point of light in the sky, and I wondered what on earth it was. It didn't, it, it didn't seem like an aircraft. It was completely cl uh, cloudless sky. But to cut a long story short, the next day I was told by a journalist that uh, many people had seen for an, uh, an hour and a quarter at least an object in the sky and they were with, with binoculars. It was an elongated tri sort of triangular thing. Frequently, um, sections would come 
away from it and then regroup and it would dart around the sky and then stay in one position for, for many minutes and I'm sure that's the identical description of, of the craft that was seen in Bentwaters Woodbridge ten days later so I don't know about that story from Valet but I can add that, that part to it and movie film uh, sorry video film was actually taken of that uh, craft as well unfortunately it, um, video was in its infancy in, in 1980 so the zoom range was, was very restricted so, so there's not, you can't really see that much apart from a, a brilliant point of light. But Tim, you're killing me. You had, you had a UFO sighting? Oh, sure. And um, as I say, when I got home, actually, I mean, because I, I, I've got, you know, cameras, zoom lenses, movie, the whole lot, telescope. Of course, that very minute, the thing decided to disappear. I'm, I swear they knew I was coming. You're, yeah, very, you're very killing me. I mean, I, as long as I've been in this field, I've never seen anything remotely like a UFO, and I'm, mm-hmm. uh, I'm jealous, man. <laughs> well, I, I, if only if only I had had you know binoculars and everything else with me, then we would have got some. I could have got some great pictures, possibly. Back to the Rendlesham Forest thing for just a moment. You know, I have great respect for Doctor Valet, and and uh, suspect that maybe he knows a little something there. But if this were in fact a a manufactured incident, a counterintelligence move or a, a debunking move. Uh, you know, it was done at a at a top secret military base. It was never meant to be made public, and it took a heck of a lot of effort to get any of the details out into the public arena. So, yeah. I it's hard to figure out what you know, you know, they would have been doing. Holt, Charles Holt, who was the deputy base commander of of both the twin air force ba- bases at that time, and, and uh, interestingly, he lives in Woodbridge. Virginia, <laughs> which uh, I find amusing, and um, uh, he he was absolutely livid, and I discussed this with him um, in person. He said, "You know, this is your government's business. It didn't happen on our territory. It happened in Rendlesham Forest, which is just outside the Twin Air Force bases. You know, it's your problem." And he never got any kind of response from the Ministry of Defence at all about it. So you would have thought, if that was a counterintelligence exercise, as, as Valley suggests, uh, uh, you would think that the deputy base commander at, at least should have been informed. Tim, you know, um, I, I'm a journalist. I'm not a philosopher. I, I can't even begin to try to figure out uh, what is in the minds of these aliens, uh, where they're from, why they're here. But there are some things that, as a journalist, I can follow, and that's the paper trail. Uh, there, there are, as you know better than anyone, perhaps, uh, there's a, a solid paper trail, government documents, secret reports, secret statements and memos from um, our military and our government, your military and your government. They're, these are documents that were never meant to be seen by the public, which describe the, the, the military's true take on UFOs and this mystery. You, you include a lot of these documents in this book, Need to Know, including this Nathan Twining memo, September of 1947, uh, in which he basically says these UFOs are real, right? Oh, yes. I mean, there's nothing spectacular about that, but, I mean, that's official. You know, the phenomenon is real and not something visionary or fictitious. That's what Twining said, and uh, that that is the official military position. And I'm, I'm surprised that more people don't, don't, don't cite that. I mean, that, that goes back to September of 1947. What are the in in, uh, in your research? What are the most uh, telling, uh, uh, provable, genuine documents from the inside that that indicate what's really going on? Oh my goodness, I wouldn't know where to start, George. I mean, there's, there's so many. Um, one of the things that's published for the first time in my book is is a, a British report, which is only released by the Ministry of Defence last year. And um, this relates to sightings in March of 1993 in the Midlands, the the central part of the United Kingdom. And there were two Royal Air Force bases at uh, RAF Shawbury and RAF Cosford, which were penetrated by unknown objects. And these were the, 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 the very large triangular type. And I've got two pages of this uh, uh, report which is uh, dated April of 1993, and it says that um, some of the reports state that the object was moving at a very high speed, while some say it was hovering or moving very slowly. Many of the reports refer to the object being very large, flying low, and making a low humming sound. My staff have spoken to a number of the military and police witnesses, many of whom commented that the object was unlike anything they had ever seen before. And... um, um, the meteorological officer at RAF 
Shawbury reported seeing the object projecting a narrow beam of light at the ground at a height of four to five hundred feet and estimated the size of this object at somewhere between a C-30, it's a cargo plane, and a Boeing 747 when it passed over his head at an estimated 4,000 feet. Um, and it continues, it concludes, in summary, there would seem to be some evidence on this occasion that an unidentified object or objects of unknown origin was operating over the, U the UK. And so it goes on. So documents like that, uh, I think, are, are, are fairly conclusive, in my opinion, at any rate. You have a, one in this book, a 1949 Air Force Intelligence Report, talking about multiple intrusions over military bases, nuclear bases, yes. things of that sort. That, that's another telling one. Um, yes. We've seen uh, memos in, uh, as late as the 1960s where Air Force uh, um, higher-ups uh, put out these uh, orders that, that that indicate that UFOs are, quote, serious business. Yes, I've got the actual – I've reproduced the actual um, uh, order – that was that was posted on all United States continental um, Air Force bases, uh, saying just how seriously this subject, you know, it, you know, saying that the press ridiculed it. But this is this is this must be rapidly identified as serious Air Force business, and um, and, and it goes on and on. I mean, again, this is all official stuff uh, from your government um, acknowledging that we're dealing with a reality here, and I'm surprised that the press don't. Uh, pick up on this more often. But let me say, talking about the press, George, I think um, listeners should know that, um, if they don't know already, that uh, there was a big article in the, in the Post, Washington Post, Sunday 21st, yesterday, that is my time. Um, and I'd like to know whether it's actually in the newspaper itself or just online. But there's a, for the first time, I, I think, in the Post in recent years, there's an, a, a serious article by Joe Heim, Washington Post staff writer. It's called In the Orbit of UFO Enthusiasts. It's been posted on the net. Um, I, I get it via Google Alert. Yeah, I've read it. Yep. You read it. I, and it, you know, it talks about Bob Swiatek and uh, a lot of serious researchers. And there's, 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 not much of an element of ridicule about it, and, and I find, I'm, very, I'm very impressed by this. I've, I've, uh, I have sort of posted a comment to Joe Heim, but I haven't had, heard anything back yet, you know. But, um, well, you know, you, we have these, uh, you know, this paper trail. It's very telling. It, it's very serious, and, and it sort of paints it in black and white that, that there really is something going on, and our military has known about it for a long time. But one reason that the, the press people... Uh, reporters may have trouble uh, pursuing this is because there are other documents that pop up from time to time that yeah. uh, uh, whose provenance is less uh, solid. I exactly. mean, the MJ-12 documents. MJ you want to ask me about MJ-12? I do. I, and the reason it's uh, it's timely now, If I don't know if you've seen the current issue of the MUFON Journal, yeah. but you were there in Denver when yeah. uh, Brad Sparks got up and delivered this scathing uh, report about the MJ-12 documents and where they came from. His basic uh, theory is that uh, Stan Friedman, Bill Moore, Jamie Chandra were working on the Roswell story, doing all this research. At the same time, uh, the information was being routed to the Air Force through Bill Moore, this agent named, intelligence officer named Rick Doty, and that he, in fact, was feeding it back to them in the form of these documents. He yeah. would take their information and create this. Do you, where do you come down on this? Well, it, well, be, well first of all, let me say that, I, I, as you know, I was the first to publish the, the, the Majestic 12 documents. Right. Um, I was amused to see um, Brad Sparks' comment that I received my copy from Rick Doty. That's absolute. Um, so it makes me wonder, you know, how, how much of the rest of his article is pure invention. Um, that is not the case. I have never released the name of the person I did obtain my documents from. But it certainly wasn't Rick Doty. I've, I've, I've never even met him. I've never communicated with him. I've tried to, to, to meet him, but he's not interested. But um, and I, as I have said, in most of my books subsequent to Above Top Secret, I believe the documents are fraudulent, but that there was a Majestic 12 document and that the whole purpose of the exercise, the people who, who fabricated the document, was to smoke out the real MJ-12. And they were successful in doing that because several people confirmed that there was a, a Majestic 12 or an MJ-12 or a Magic 12. Now, one of whom was Dr. Eric Walker who was a British physicist and a Harvard graduate, um, and he was former executive secretary of the Research and Development Board, chairman of National Science Foundation's Committee for Engineering, and so on, and president of Pencil Penn State University. And this is in a recorded conversation with Bill Steinman in 1987. 
confirmed that he'd attended meetings at Wright-Patterson concerning the military recovery of flying saucers and, and um, occupants, and he confirmed the existence of MJ-12. So, and would, uh, would Sarbacher... I beg your pardon? Think, would Sarbacher, Robert Sarbacher, uh, would he be on that short list of people who've confirmed it? Yes. Um, in, in not, not sort of directly, but certainly indirectly, and other people have confirmed that there was definitely a Magic 12 on MJ-12. And um, um, I mentioned um, Andy Kistner, the, the, the former state representative for Las Cruces, who gave me a lot of information. He believes, and I've published it in the book, that the acronyms MAJIC and MJ-12 could have been formed from the Manhattan, short for Manhattan Engineering District, Joint Chiefs of Staff Integrated Command, Project Y of Division Z Group 12. Now, I won't go into all that's all rather com complex, mm -hmm. but um, I was in touch with uh, Sandia Laboratories historian, uh, Rebecca Ulrich, um, it, for my research in, into, into all this, and she said she's never, she had no records pertaining to anything like that, MG-12, Magic-12, or Majestic. But I think another possibility suggested by uh, Dr. Wood uh, who, of course, is uh, very much involved in the Majestic um, controversies, that MAGIC was formed for military assessment of the Joint Intelligence Committee, and that sounds uh, quite quite possible as well. But it remains clear to me that there was definitely a, 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 an, a, an organization of, of, of that name. Um, tell me this. You, you mentioned that you know, you're know you not going to tell us who your source is, where you no. got the uh, the MJ-12 documents from. You, you know it wasn't from uh, Rick Certainly Doty. Is it, Doty. No. is it at all possible that your source had some contact with Rick Doty, that Doty might have fed uh, the documents to he it, or her? I'm, I'm sure it's possible. Okay. Um, so, uh, so do you believe that there's an MJ-12 now? Or something well, like it? by whatever name, yes, I do, definitely. Do you have uh, any kind of proof, or it's just a feeling that I there... Don't have, if, I don't have any proof, no. More of a feeling that there would have to be someone that would handle this stuff? Uh, absolutely no question about it. What's your take on Colonel Phil Corso? I think he's on the, on the level. Unfortunately, he didn't check the manuscript before it was published, so there are a number of errors, and things have been slipped in by his co-author, um, which um, are not quite accurate, but I think essentially, yes, he was absolutely on the level. Moreover, uh, people have tried to tell me that Corso was, had nothing to do with the National Security Council. This is this I've been able to disprove because I have the actual um, military his military papers, which confirm that although he wasn't on the National Security Council itself, and maybe that was just part of the, uh, the, the, the manuscript he didn't check in his book, he served on the intelligence staff of the National Security Council's Operation Coordinations Board, uh, later known as the Special Group 5412, then Special Group 5412-2, which, which planned, coordinated, approved, and evaluated the most sensitive covert paramilitary and clandestine operations ever mounted by the United States government. So that's what Corso was doing top secret work as an intelligence officer at the National Council, but he didn't actually stand on the National Council, the Security Council itself. Right. And now, you know, one of the, the main criticisms of Corso, he, he had said that uh, that technology, that materials from crashed or recovered saucers had been sort of filtered out to industry, to national labs and things of that sort. In the 60s, and, yeah, the early 60s. Yeah, in the and of course, the critics have said, "No, nah, that's a bunch of baloney. We developed this stuff on our own." There's a there's a paper trail to show where uh, fiber optics and things like that came from. That's but right. absolutely uh, right. Well, Corso's take on that was he told um, a friend of mine um, who was, is very well informed. He told that person, scientist, that that was not what he he his position was that um, they actually farmed this stuff out to the american industrial corporations at a time when people were starting to work on this so it wasn't as described in the book um, but so, so the critics are absolutely right but corso himself was very upset that that's the way it came across in the book and it's not what he what he maintained you know, you and I, uh, we started our conversation with uh, talking about disclosure and, and how it might work and why it's unlikely. Uh, it, it, this, uh, this topic came up while we were in Denver. Um, 
You know, there are a lot of groups in the UFO field who are pushing for congressional hearings as if that would somehow be a revelation and, and it would be, you know, a smooth sailing after that. What's what's your take on congressional hearings? Uh, possible, <laughs> likely, unlikely, uh, un, unproductive? Listen, listen, I've been involved for decades um, periodically assisting congressmen, a number of your, your congressmen in, in inquiries with the object of getting closed hearings. Um, each one of them has been stopped or has, has otherwise sort of ground to a halt, um, occasionally un, in suspicious circumstances. And I'm not going to go much further than that, except to say that Congress is sewn up and there are not enough people with enough guts to, to pursue it because uh, they will be discouraged, to put it that way. To put well, it I think they will yeah. be discouraged from, from having anything any, like uh, um, closed hearings with the object of, of uh, opening up information. I think I've spoken to some of the same people that you've uh, you've spoken to. I know that there is interest among some uh, elected members of Congress in this topic, but it's got to be on a very quiet level. And, um, you know, just from a pure political standpoint, they'd be crucified uh, for showing an interest in a topic that so many people think is, is goofy. The other thing I worry about is, and maybe you can comment on it as, on it as well, is the, the existence of, of uh, highly vocal uh, UFO groups who would raise hell if they were left out of any congressional hearing. And these, these are groups who uh, uh, have very controversial beliefs um, that are not even shared by most of the people in the UFO field perhaps created specifically for the purpose of, of deterring congressional hearings. Yeah, quite likely. I go along with you. Um, tell me about the book now. Is it available here in the, in the States it now? It was published on Friday, George. Or th- oh. well, the 18th, anyway. When was, when was the 18th? Was that Thursday, Thursday Friday? Um, and it, it should be in the shops. I haven't had any reports yet. Uh, Otherwise, but uh, it, it is over. It, it's overdue by quite a number of months. So I know people have been frustrated in trying to get it. And um, of course, you can get it on a- Amazon um, uh, for a cheaper price and, and so forth. But uh, it should any- be in the bookshops. And uh, um, if there's any problem, um, you know, you can you can put people in touch with me. If, if, if okay. Necessary. Well, need to know UFOs, the military, and intelligence by Tim Good. That's the book. Uh, any chance you're going to do a a book tour? You coming over here to, to speak? I, I wish, but I can't afford it, believe it or not. Unfortunately, I'd love to do that. And um, I'm cooperating with my publisher uh, as best I can in, in promoting the book. But um, I shall certainly be over uh, in the States um, next year. Um, you're working on another book already? Or can you tell no, us? No, I'm still recovering from this one, clearing <laughs> the debris, all the research material. And is your publisher, you know, I know you've, this is a different publisher for you this time? It is, yes. Pegasus Books of, of, of New York. And um, on my website, there are details of how to contact them should, should any difficulties arise with um, obtaining books. And um, there's, uh, I can also send, if anyone wants me to send them the, the press release, I'd, I'd be glad to do that. There's uh, one other glad, question. I'd be glad to give any, any interviews um, uh, in, in people's local towns or radio stations or whatever. Unrelated to the UFO cover-up stuff that you, we're discussing in your book, Need to Know, it's about Skinwalker Ranch, which is, of course, is something that I've written about, the Utah Ranch. And uh, w- while we're researching, the, the working on the book about uh, the strange goings on there, we come across your reference to a similar ranch in Colorado. Do you? I know it's been a while since you looked at this stuff. Can you remember enough details to know whether the comparison is valid? I think very valid indeed. This I wrote in my book, um, I believe it was Alien Contact, the one in the States, and they called it Alien Liaison. Over here I had a chapter on that. I think it was called Colorado Breakthrough or just Breakthrough, I forget which, but but I found that very interesting, particularly since there was a U.S. Air Force officer involved, and it wasn't that far from the U.S. Air Force Base, and these Bigfoot sightings, all manner of of strange things, and uh, UFO sightings, and actual contacts with humanoid type occupants, and I find that a very, very compelling case. So there are parallels it, with, with uh, the Skinwalker business. Any possibility that that was some sort of a disinformation campaign or psychological exercise, or do you have an opinion? I, it, yes, <laughs> it may well have been a psychological exercise, George, but, you know, the question is who, who's perpetrating it. I mean, uh, the aliens aren't above sort of befuddling us, and are they? <laughs> no, they are not, and neither is our government. 
Um, it's been a fascinating couple of hours. Thanks for all the great calls, everyone. Thanks to John Lear and, of course, to the Coast to Coast team. If you want to listen to our show ad-free, 24-7, access audio archives, live chat with me, and much more, you need to become a Coast Insider now. So you're telling me your grandmother, who died a few weeks ago, came and visited you last night in your bedroom, and you're not scared? Are extraterrestrials living among us? I don't know if it's true or not, folks, but we're going to find out. If you enjoy stories like these and want to learn more about the mysteries of the universe with me, become a Coast Insider now to access hundreds of our archive shows to listen anytime, anywhere. Sign up now at coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. That's coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider.